Matthew Allison, how are you, my dear friend? Very well, thank you. Good to see you. It is good to see you, Matthew. I hope life's treating you all right. It is. Oh, good. Oh, good. I, yeah. I have. I we are good. I don't know if I've had a single. We actually had our first non rotten cantaloupe, so that was good. Uh, you know, because there is nothing like biting into cantaloupe and finding out it's rotten. You go, oh, because you actually can't tell by the color if it is or not. Thank you. I thank you for filling me in. And I suppose we could start with the cantaloupe as a <laughs> as a yeah as an analogical bridge to whatever we might discuss next. Yeah. So one could look at the sliced cantaloupe as this falsely accused piece of evidentiary health. <laughs> We can, by tasting a healthy orange cantaloupe, our conviction that the world is good and all the ingredients that make up the world are testaments to the proof of the inherent value registered as healthfulness, mm. the soundness of the world comes through this cantaloupe at a given chew in time. But when that color betrays us. And in fact, it is unhealthy. It's corrupted. It's bad tasting. We could look at it as this falsely appearing thing, this piece of evidence with a mind of its own. Or we could look at it instead of as a renegade piece of cantaloupe in this uh, universe of health, otherwise healthy ingredients to the cosmos. We could look at it as non-informational. The orange as a secondary quality, a la Locke, is not there to tell us something about a primary quality in the subject. Mm. And so the orangeness is beside the point of the internal corruption. So, in that regard, in the non informational camp, not everything in the universe is commentary mm. yeah. on the state of the universe. Whereas in the former category, everything is presumed to be commentary hmm. on the state of affairs in the universe that obtain in the universe. In this case, what would have been a commentary to its overall goodness by its roguishness has uh, went off the beaten path. Which of these two camps should we put the cantaloupe in and hmm. by extension our conversation? Hmm. That, that's a lovely question because it is funny you know, why does it feel like the cantaloupe betrayed you? You know, it didn't do anything. It wasn't out to get you. It didn't tell you, hey, I'm going to taste good. <laughs> you know, it's also interesting. There's a few things. First, it seems more difficult for taste to deceive than sight, right? That's kind of interesting. Like when you bite into something, you don't tend to go, oh, I was deceived. You tend to say, oh, the apple was bad or it went bad, but it doesn't have the same. It's interesting. Like the word deception and trickery tends to go with sight more than taste. Um, you know, and, it, and it's interesting. Like, how do you have a false taste versus like a false sight? Like it's easier to imagine seeing something that's deceiving you than taste. I, I was thinking about that. But it's also interesting with the cantaloupe how the feeling of roguedness is an interplay between the expectation based on the sight that you then lead to an expectation of the taste that doesn't meet that taste, right? Like it has to kind of work together, right? But then at the same time, you know, the cantaloupe was pretty. You could have just enjoyed the sight of it or maybe cut it up and put it in a glass bowl on the table and had it be something to look at, right? It only feels roguish because your use that you were going to put it toward was for the taste and eating, which then worked in a relationship with how it looked, that worked in a relationship with what you expected to then make you go, ah, surprise, this isn't what I thought it was, right? And it is interesting too, because roguishness seems very difficult without expectation, without a, like, it, like if, 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 um, if you've never seen a cantaloupe before, and someone offered to you it for the very first time and you bit into it, you wouldn't feel, ah, you'd say, oh, I don't like that fruit. You may not even think it's bad. You may just, you may actually think that's what cantaloupe tastes like. And I do not like them because they are like, um, what was like grapefruit, 
like, you know, the grapefruit when you're a kid, you're like, why do all why do all the adults eat this? What is going on? And then you get older and you're eating grapefruit and you're like, uh, so, you know, <laughs> you're like, um, so it's very interesting, too, because also like primary quality, if that's the taste of the cantaloupe. Well, that's within the horizon where you're used to you're used to eating it with cantaloupe, right? You know, if instead you you said, no, 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 this is a poisonous fruit. It's just, um, or for example, you, you had a culture that said it doesn't taste good or it's poisonous, then maybe its use would be um, aesthetic, setting on the table, right? You know, and so you would have a different cultural expectation, which then, of course, funny enough, suggests there's a story at play, right? There's some sort of narrative that is already in operation that in order to say this thing deceived me, there's a way in which it doesn't fit into the story, um, which then you could say, oh, so we're saying it's relative to utility. But that gets to some of that, you know, that we that, with that interesting conversation on story with Pajot and different things. It's not really pragmatism, though. It's more of expectation. It's more of kind of the narrative arc that the thing isn't fitting into. That is a consequence of the relation and interplay between the taste and the sight. Because if you opened, it is, and then I'll give it back to you. If you opened a cantaloupe and it was um, green or white and you bit into it, it wasn't good. You say, well, of course, it wasn't right. I could see that. The only reason the cantaloupe feels like it kind of surprised you is because it looked ripe, but then it turned out it wasn't. But if it looked like it wasn't ripe, like another example is um, we had our first white watermelon. Huh, didn't know that was a thing. Opened it up and it was pure white inside. And go, well, this didn't grow right, but let's let's try it. So we cut it and we ate it and we're like, well, it's not terrible. It's it's a lot of salt, but it's not terrible. So it's like you open the watermelon, once you see it's white, you you know it's not going to taste like you think it was. So you actually, it's interesting because then you know you're kind of taking an adventure, you're taking a risk. And it's interesting because what's the difference between being tricked and choosing to take a risk that may blow up on your face, right? It's the expectation based on the thing that you see that makes you then orient yourself relative to it as, oh, I'm just going to try this white watermelon, even though I know it probably won't take good. I'm going to take that risk. So you orient yourself toward the white watermelon in a very different way than when you look at what looks to be a ripe cantaloupe, you orient yourself toward it as if the taste is going to be good. Right. And it is interesting because then the eyes, it's almost as if the eyes are not so much saying what the thing is, but orienting your relationship to it, your positioning to it. Like your eyes are the calibration. I'm orienting myself toward this thing with a certain expectation. And then my test, the test is the mouth, the taste. Was that a good orientation or not? And it's interesting because then the eyes, like, it's not merely, it's almost like the feeling of roguedness and deception is a result of not seeing your eyes as the conditioning of your relationship to the fruit, but thinking that it's giving you the true disclosure or a false disclosure, as opposed to a certain positioning you in relation to the thing that will then be confirmed by your taste, right? Mm -hmm. So it is interesting because we often, we say seeing is believing, right? We associate sight with like truth. Oh, I see it. Therefore. Right. But it's interesting because it's not it's almost as if seeing seeing is coordination. Seeing is positioning yourself to seeing is believing, but it's but believing is orientation to believing is posturing yourself toward. Right. Seeing is posturing yourself toward. And it is interesting how the sight of the cantaloupe um, then postures yourself toward it in a certain way that then when you taste it, you say, I didn't have the right posture. But then it's interesting because how could you have had a different posture, though? It looked like it was going to be right. It looked like it was going to taste good. How in the world, how can you open a cantaloupe that looks right and say, no, I need to posture myself toward this as if it's going to taste bad? Is that even possible? Not really, right? Like you almost, you'd almost have to. And if you were postured toward it as if it might taste bad doesn't that make you paranoid or something or like you know not trusting it like you're kind of crazy right um so it's also interesting on i think that feeling of roguedness is also tied to a feeling of i couldn't have done otherwise 
I had to have been toward the cantaloupe as if it would have been good. And so you're like, grr, cantaloupe, grr. <laughs> you know, you, you set me up. So it's interesting, too. Like, it, it, in seeing something, you're conditioned toward the thing. And then if it turns out it wasn't good, how could you have done otherwise? And then I, then I guess the bigger question is, what is... What is the very fact of that entire situation unfolding say about reality, <laughs> say about how humans are to act in the world where we find ourselves having to give ourselves over to something because we have to condition our relation to it, even if it turns out that wasn't the right condition, but we could have done no other. Uh, so those were some thoughts that came to mind. And it, and it is very funny how... The eyes are orienting your expectation, orienting the way. Which then, of course, when the Bible says, you know, set your eyes on the unseen, it's basically saying posture yourself toward that which is unseen. Well, that's really hard. Like when I'm in a room with a bookcase and lighting, I naturally and subconsciously posture myself for this environment, right? It seems really, really hard to condition and posture yourself toward the unseen, right? And yet that's Seeing the unseen would be conditioning and posturing yourself toward a very different environment than the one you're in. So those are those are some thoughts. Um, I didn't die from the cantaloupe, so that was good. But there was that moment of going <laughs> and going, well, I guess we will not be having cantaloupe smoothie. Um, and then when I saw the squirrel run out and get the little remain in the field and then run off without it, I was like, yeah, that, that's, <laughs> not a very, <laughs> that's not a good cantaloupe. That, that's not a good cantaloupe. No, no. But let me give it back to you, Matthew. <laughs> that was good. I think you introduced, along with the seeds of the cantaloupe, the seeds of a vocabulary, mm. a philosophical index for our conversation tonight. Coordination. Mm. Proximity to. And thesis, mm. which, by the way, is the Greek word for a position. So we grew up with prompts given to us by our teachers. And they said to us with pen in hand, write a thesis and make sure your thesis is near the top and unfold the body of your paragraph beneath the thesis. And I thought, what is a thesis? Is that a question? Is it an answer? What's a thesis anyway? Well, it is the Greek equivalent to the word position. It, it's, a, it's a place among places. So why this place? Why this thesis? So I think seeing the word geographically helps us to understand it theoretically. And when we look at something theoretically through a geographic lens, we begin to see in proximity to what we are after. And so that brings in the proximity to phrase. Now the coordination I think is a necessary precondition to the possibility of gaining in proximity to what we are after. When we see a thesis relative to the thesis we are in, you see, a position relative to the position we are in and Hence, we go from place to place, in lieu of, as the French would say. We can now begin to speak in place of. So now we can import metaphors, analogies on our way to closer proximity with what we think we are after, which now I can substitute that phrase, think what we are after with your nice word expectation and by bringing expectation to bear on this journey in proximity to we begin to see the profound implications of saying that our thesis is one of relation and so our important terms along the way will have to do with relations and not and one marker of us stepping outside the bounds or beyond the healthy parameters into the unhealthy wasteland that no squirrel 
would spend <laughs> much time in, for it won't find much sustenance. It, it count it quite a drag to move its bushy tail throughout this place outside the parameter. Nowhere near proximity to. We would find that our language will map onto our embodiment. And our essence, our nature, would not seem so mysterious to us. Rather, other things would seem more mysterious to us. And I think we would then begin to find why certain things are stressed in our tradition. So, for example, in the garden, Adam and Eve were tempted by a serpent to what? Pluck the fruit with their hand, but it takes pains to describe what she saw before she reached for the thing. And it, take, it takes pains in describing what she sees. In contrast to the prior commandment, not to reach for. So the commandment put on one side of the balance sheet with the way in which it appeared to her, it says it was good to the eye and desirable to make one wise. Those two things now are juxtaposed. Or if I may, one thesis is put next to another thesis. Because Adam and Eve were asked by their circumstance to remember the place where God said, of all you may eat, except this one you shall not eat. Time passed and they moved on to the tree and it was presented. What they were asked to do by that circumstance was to remember and go back to the original position. By reaching forward and closing that proximity to, we might say prematurely, they undid the possibility of what healthy orange could have eventuated from their staying in the original thesis and growing within it. Because not only did they not undo the original position by reaching forward in advance, they made the original position all the more strong. They made it stronger because indeed they brought death into the world as promised or guaranteed in the original thesis. So just as they jump-started prematurely their wisdom, they jump-started something that needed not to exist, death. And that was done through, if I may say, hand-eye coordination. So we have to talk about coordination and we have to talk about proximity too. No, I think that's exactly right. And hand-eye coordination is very interesting because one wonders what coordination would be possible if it was just the eye, right? Like what could the eye just coordinate? Like what does the eye coordinate but the body, the hand, the expectations, right? It's, it's very interesting because, well, it all suggests that the senses, like in the philosophy, there's this question of like what, you know, knowledge of the senses, right? It, it's more like senses are a coordination family, like a family of coordination mechanisms that is determining how you are toward things, which then in a funny way, that towardness brings with it, um, it's relative to a certain narrative, a certain story, a certain origin, um, or a certain direction. And then the movement of the hand is then the kind of willingness to, as if you're kind of writing the story that you're, as you're picking the apple, it's like the movement of the hand of the author, right? Like, it's almost like 
the hand is always coordinating. The eye is always coordinating a hand that's writing something. Uh, because also the eye is coordinating the hand relative to, you know, all of the things that the eye sees the apple or the fruit, you know, participating in, right? Like we, we see... We don't just see isolated facts or isolated phenomena. We see things participating in an entire narrative, right? Like, it's very interesting. What did the serpent say? Well, you'll be like God. Like, it seemed far easier not to eat that fruit until you had introduced the horizon or the notion that this fruit will make you like God, right? Then suddenly a temptation enters because there's, there's an alternative narrative that has been introduced, right? And it's interesting, too, because... Was the fruit, was the tree of knowledge a temptation before they were told, you know, do you know, before they, you know, the serpent was like, you'll be like God, right? Mm. You know, in a way, obviously, but it's interesting how it doesn't seem like it was. It wasn't like we have narratives before the serpent of Adam and Eve saying, oh man, I'd really like to eat from that tree. Uh, but no, what you get is they don't seem to care. <laughs> like it's like, okay, we fine, no problem, God. We won't eat from it. Like it wasn't even. It, it, it was almost as if a parent was saying, hey, if you jump off this cliff, you're die. Okay, it's not really a temptation because if you jump off the cliff, you die. It's more like just facticity, right? It's very facticity. interesting yes. before the serpent speaks that the tree of knowledge, it, it doesn't seem to be a temptation in the same way. It seems more just like a facticity. It's like, this, will, this is bad, okay. But then once it is introduced, hey, You'll be like God. Oh, suddenly the same action that was there all along transforms. Like, like it is interesting to think what's the difference between don't jump off the cliff, you'll die, and a temptation. Is it really a temptation to jump off a cliff? Not really, because you'll die. Like, I, you know, there are obviously some suicidal situations, maybe. But generally speaking, it's more, of course, it's more of a facticity sort of matter, right? A temptation has to bring with it some sort of new narrative, some sort of new story, some sort of new possibility that the eye, because what's also funny is the eye would have seen the same fruit, the same tree before and after, right? And yet the apple, and yet the eye is actually seeing something else. And it's coordinating the hand towards something else, right? Like there, it is not, it's, it's the same act and yet it's entirely different, right? And so there's this notion where what really, like when we are coordinating the body, when we are coordinating ourselves, the, the, the big moments of like that are really narratively significant because what's also interesting um, like the difference between the cliff and the temptation is kind of a narrative relevance. You know, there's in Verveke the the relevance realization. Peugeot will talk about that because we care. He was saying, sure, I could learn that there's a, you know, there's a baseball on the corner of New York Street at four o'clock, but I don't care, right? So there's a kind of care that truth and care go together. What's very interesting is why is a temptation different from simply jumping off a cliff, like in facticity, right? Well, there's yeah. actually a care in that too, right? There's a kind of, oh, well, now I care about this tree, right? Because it turns out it's not merely the, I don't really care about the fact when I'm told, hey, if you um, jump off this cliff, you'll die. I don't really care about that risk because it's just part of the landscape, right? But when I'm told this, this fruit will make you like God, well, suddenly I kind of care about the tension. I know God told me not to, but I'm being told it will make me like God. I now care about that contradiction. I now care about it, right? And it's very interesting because it's almost like there's some there's something like relevant realization here that seems a little different. It's not merely the realization of something relevant to you. It's the realization of something that... It could be relevant to you or that has a certain possibility, a certain you're you want it to actually do what the, the Satan you want it to make you like God. Right. So it's a realization of a possible narrative to enter into that you feel some sort of restriction from. Right. Because like a lot of times in relevant realization, it's a notion that you, you care about this. 
but it's not necessarily something you're restricted from caring about, right? You may, it may be in your environment, you care about this bookshelf because you're trying to get a book off of it, right? But, but in the case of the tree of knowledge, suddenly you care about eating this fruit and you know you can't, right? And, or you've been told not to, right? And so there's a coordination of the body against that limitation there that you want to realize beyond the other side of the restriction. Um, and that that's not really just reducible to the eye seeing the tree. It has to be your, you know, your position in the position. It has to be your coordination toward it that is introduced as a temptation once, you know, Satan says, you know, if you eat from this tree, you will, um, you, you, you will be like God. And it's kind of funny too, because I like what you, and then I'll give it to you. It's interesting, that idea of in place of. Um, it's interesting because how funny it is that sometimes we can, we can change the place that we're in by using something in place of the place that we're in, like the metaphor. We understand a thing better by pointing beyond itself, right? Well, a temptation is the introduction of a world in place of the world that you were given before, right? You know, you were given Eden, uh, you're given paradise, and you say, if you eat from this tree in place of this world, you will then have a world where you are like God, right? You know, it's, it's actually, it's almost like they're, instead of, it's almost like the tree of knowledge is supposed to coordinate your behavior in the garden, but instead what you're doing is using the tree to be what is the coordination like it's it's do it's becoming yep. the primary thing right as opposed right. to instead tracing out the territory you then want it to become the territory when really it is more so tracing things out and so it's so the thing that you are supposed to be acting from you then act to and then because of that it changes the entire narrative that you are in um those are some thoughts, but and it's and I like what you were also saying about premature. That's very interesting because there's a way in which you it it's not that the thing is bad, but that you're acting premature, so you are not properly coordinated or properly relating to it. So there's an improper posturing that's going on. And I also like the point on thesian thesis position, uh, which also suggests that a thesis tells you your position in your place right? Where is your position? And so likewise, when Satan says you'll be like God, then suddenly you're given the, you, your position is being denied likelihood you're God. It's changing your position. Now your position in the Eden is a denial of being like God. Whereas before your position was, well, safety, this is a cliff, you'll fall off and die, right? It changed the thesis. It changed the position that you were in the place of Eden. So I really like what you say, but let me throw it at you. And this is one of the benefits of our long discourses is we extend the compressed manner in which information is encoded in our tradition. So, for example, by extension, and then we'd go to the text to find where this plays itself out, you can look at the description of the making of the universe as the precondition for Adam and Eve. And then when you look at the traits or the characteristics of that preconditioning for their existence, you find a little melody, a pattern. that can't be isolated by its parts because you're finding this thing carried over, whether we're talking about the separation of light from darkness or the separation of the waters or of the gathering of the dry land into one place, or we're talking about the creatures from the deep, or we're talking about the birds of the air. What we're talking about is division, separation, which is, to my mind, analytic. Now, analytic means cut up, but it doesn't have the negative connotation of destruction. 
it, it means separation, that not everything is confused, not everything is one blob. Things can be in harmony because they are intrinsically separated. And their values can shine together or be weighted with one another by virtue of the fact that they're not confused. Okay. If we accept that as a precondition in the first few lines of Genesis, we could ask ourselves, hypothetically, would the narrative explaining proximities to, which are another way, the flip side of the coin of referring to separation of, proximity to, separation of, the journey or the narrative in Adam and Eve's failure to mature or question of maturity, we could say. Because what if we only had the claim, all the trees are available to you and are good for eating, period. Well, we would say, oh, I guess everything I said about the preconditioning for the existence of Adam and Eve following this melody of division and separation of without destroying one or the other, and none of these elements becoming confused with each other, that doesn't relate at all, is not relevant to this garden. So why the preamble? Mm. It says all the trees are good for you to eat, but separation. Mm. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat because on the day you eat of it there that on the day you eat of it you shall die. Ah, so we're having division here, separation of. But still the tree was in the garden. So it was separated but it wasn't exiled. So it was separated, it wasn't not made. You see what I'm saying? So it's not the division of existence non-existence that's being played with here or that's being canvassed, it's a different kind of separation. And it's notable that this separation is in the context of a relationship. Person speaking to person. So that is on the wings of the preconditioning in the lines before, but is not reducible to the lines which came before. We could talk about eminence and emergence here, and the higher levels not being reducible to the lower levels. In the same way that the separation of the tree of knowledge from all the other trees is not a separation that is reducible to all the way down the separation of light from darkness. But there is an echo. There is an understanding that can be applied. I think back to the word attention that has a lot of currency uh, amongst different speakers. And the other day I looked up its word in Greek. It's a fun word. It's a compound word. It's two different parts that can be separated. The word is proseki. I don't know how to say it in the Greek, but the first part of it is P-R-O-S, pros or pro, towards. You're used to the word towards. And that other half, eki, E-X-E, is from or has its root in the word echo. So the Greek understanding of the word attention, which is a Latin word, by the way, is to be towards the echo. And what is an echo? But the holding of what came before. So to go towards the holding of what came before is to what? Well, give attention to. Now we've been giving attention to the preconditionings for, and now we're being asked to give attention to this new thing in the universe of discourse, namely a commandment. So what is the difference between let there be and there was and commandment, now your response? Mm -hmm. What is the difference there? Mm -hmm. Because there is a difference. Mm -hmm. Magnificent. Um, first, I think that is an outstanding point that what we see continued in Eden is thematically harmonious with the creative act up to that point. There's always a division 
but not an exiling or a, you know, everything or not. That's very important. The thing that is distinct needs to stay in relationship with, which seems critical. You know, it you can't have relationship without otherness. And yet otherness seems to not be the thing. Therefore, don't you want to get rid of it? No, you need that distinction. And then, of course, you know, we've talked about Leibniz before. A thing can only know itself in light of what it is not. Like similarity comes out in relate. You don't actually know the form. Like for Leibniz, similarity is form. But where do you see similarity, right? You know, similarity is quite mysterious. Why are two bookcases similar? They're the very act of bringing them together shows they're not the same thing. And yet, bringing them together, as he talks about in analysis sitas, as the great Anthony Morley talks so what well, explains so well, the very act of bringing them together unveils there's something between them that they are both participating in that is realized in the act of showing they're different, right? And so similarity is a testament to relationship, but where there is similarity, there is different difference as well, otherwise it would be the same, right? And if it was the same, there actually wouldn't be sameness, there'd just be one thing. So in a weird way, sameness always vanishes. Matthew, please. Mag no, I just want to say magnificent point. That's so important to say in abbreviation, what you just said, as far as what we're doing so far with this narrative account. Yeah. Similarity is not sameness. Ah, excellent. And in similarity, I think we've spoken before about mystery. There's something extremely mysterious about similarity because yes. you see it clear as day. And yet if I asked you, what is it? It would be very difficult to say what it is, right? Like it's almost like love. Why do you love this person? If if you can explain it, there's a problem, right? Like the, <laughs> you know, there's a problem. Uh, so similarity, you know, Leibniz really wanted to say that when Plato and all, you know, this mysterious doctrine of form is arising in philosophy, really, it has a lot to do with similarity. Um, you know, formal cause is not the same as shape in Aristotle. It's more like this similarity. But similarity is mysterious. But similarity is always a relational term that is at the same time not reducible to the facticity. Like you don't see, you can't find the similarity of bookcase A with bookcase B in the ad in the material, the material of the bookcase. You can't find it. It's in the judgment of someone looking at it. And yet it would be ridiculous to say that judgment is arbitrary or merely subjective. Actually, for Leibniz, it suggests that all intelligibility is actually somehow Trinitarian always already, because intelligibility is an identification of a form that is a similarity that requires an observer and a judgment. And, you know, you need three. You always need three in an act of judgment. You need someone to see the two things, that they're different, but also see that they're similar. So there's always a kind of Trinitarian structure to all intelligibility but that comes out on what you're saying with the structure of there's light and dark okay so now they're similar light and dark are similar but then you know they're also different why because you're reading it you're judging the difference right there's a relationship in the very acknowledgement of the distinction which if you just cast darkness into darkness into not knowing there wouldn't be no there would be none of that there would be no relationship right oh, well, and and so you know that because there's also a way in which the distinction of the tree of knowledge from the rest of the garden creates the otherness that then affords the very judgment of what is going on because there's that otherness that can bring out similarities so so you say you kind of need that distinction to even make intelligible what's going on right so there's there's that weird way that what ends up happening is when you eat from the tree, you remove similarity. There's no, because there's no otherness anymore. There's no distinction. And then if you remove similarity from the garden, similarity is relationship. And so you lose the relational, then God can't walk with them anymore. There's an interesting way in which relation vanishes in that very act, which you would seem like it's the most intimate relationship because you're grabbing the apple, you're grabbing the fruit. Well, isn't that a more intimate relationship? No, because it's actually removing the distinction necessary for the relationship. It's turning it into sameness. Now this tree is like all the other trees. It's just another tree that you can eat from, right? Well, what happens when you have sameness? You lose the two things that are the same are not two things. They're one thing. 
Sameness is always a threat to the relationship, right? And so if you eat from this tree like you do all the other trees, it becomes more like them, therefore it loses distinction, therefore it loses the relational horizon of this entire place, right? There is no distinction you need to honor to maintain the form of this place, the way that it is known. And of course you lose that then. And so I, I think the other thing that's very interesting as you were um, talking and you said the word confusion, it's very interesting because confuse, fake fusion, right? Like there's something interesting about a confusion which things are together. Like they wouldn't be confusing if they wouldn't together. The problem is it's a fake fusion. They're together in a non-intelligible way now. Confusion is not the loss of togetherness. It is an unordered togetherness. It's where everything's mixing in a kind of non-ordered way, right? That it's a fake fusion. Confusion is not, it's not things apart, it's things together in a non-intelligible way, right? Well, the act of removing distinction, making this tree like all the others, then actually means that this tree is like all the others, but it's a fake fusion. And it creates a confusion because there is no distinction anymore by which we can determine the right order of how we are to relate to these things together, right? Like, because, because it also kind of suggests if, like another way to put it, okay, the defining feature of the tree of knowledge is that God said, do not eat from it. Well, if you can eat from it, then what God says doesn't go. Well, if what God says doesn't go, there is no ordering principle to Eden anymore. Like the entire, the entire universe was created from God speaking, right? Okay, well, you just said, you in this very act, you have suggested that what God says doesn't go. It does not follow. Well, then it's not an ordering principle now. It has no authority. You're saying it doesn't have authority. You're saying that the universe can unfold distinct from the ordering principle of God speaking, right? So then basically, there's an equal sign between a universe that God speaks into existence and one that's just a fake fusion. Everything just coming together, however it comes together, right? There's no difference anymore because they equal the same thing. Well, once they equal the same thing, they lo it loses intelligibility, right? And a new intelligibility just comes out of nowhere, you know, please. And you know what, you know what? I, instead of a new intelligibility, in place of, intelligibility i think what comes about with that equal sign is indifference i.e not caring mm. i don't care then i don't care then and everything we said about the peugeot method of treating care in the way that a scientist would treat a microscope also goes out the window oh the account for how everything came to be and is intelligible, I don't care. Wow. Farewell. <laughs> what that then means is the subordinate parts that rely on a superordinate care that flows downward are left to their own devices. And I think this signals the onrush of corruption manifested as the passions, which from the Latin is the sufferings, being driven, a being driven by impulse, not intelligence, not perception, but like a duck, being force-fed to make its liver grow so that some people somewhere can have foie gras. Our subordinate parts are force-fed whatever the fair, F-A-R-E of the day is. And we're enlarged by body alone. And that is a signal of our corruption. That's a signal of our suffering. That's a signal of there being no care cascading down. Because we have said, oh, if this equals that, why should I care?
Let's eat and drink and be merry, as St. Paul said, for tomorrow we die. Fill up my liver. Someone else can eat the foie gras. You hit the nail on the head with that equal sign because it relates to the phenomenology of care. Well, it, it's interesting. The word indifferent is perfect here because there's a weird thing where if there is no difference, there is indifference, right? Like that's what's weird. Indifference equals not difference. So a lack of difference means I cannot care, but difference is also the thing that makes it hard to care, right? Because you're different. It's hard to care about you. It's hard to know how to care about you, right? And yet indifference is a result of no difference. Um, and well, isn't that what I mean? Oh, it's all the same. Vanity of vanities, you know, everything is flat. It's all just, you know, appetite. There's this weird thing. Well, there's a weird thing where sin leads you to a place where it's like vanity of vanities or it's all commodity form or it's all flattened under capital. Whatever way we want to put it, there's an interesting way in which often people associate not caring with everything is the same, right? Yep, yep, great and, point. And it's odd because if everything's the same, isn't that great? You know, you don't have to worry about anything. It's all the same. And yet it's so weird because it's as if human beings subconsciously know that if everything is the same, it's not good. Like we yeah. just know that. Well, why couldn't everything be the same and it be cotton candy or happy or a festival, right? We just intuitively know that the only way everything is the same is flattening. Like it's just, there's just a way in which we get that until, you know, you know, the beautific vision that really the things are not all going to be the same in beauty or bliss or whatever. It, if they're all the same in this life, something has gone wrong, right? We just seem to get that. And that's very interesting because at the same time, we seem often coordinated to remove risk and to make sure nothing surprises us and to make sure that everything basically is routine, right? There's an interesting way in which we also associate responsibility with a certain removing of surprise and difference. And yet, at the same time, if we're too successful, you could almost say, then we're like, it's all the same, who cares, right? So there's a very interesting tension there, very similar to similarity that's totally similar is sameness, which means there's not two things, there's one thing, so it, it vanishes itself, right? It, it vanishes itself, right? And so likewise, if we actually succeed in our efforts to routine, pattern, make sure we have something reliable and it's safe, if we're too secure, if we're too successful in that, we actually then make everything the same and then we become indifferent to it, right? But I think this, this goes by, back to a lot of this coordination notion that a lot of what senses are doing or thinking is not is not to just know true or false but to coordinate ourselves to make sure we have the right relationship between difference and um and 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 similarity right. um you know relation but also um distinction right and what you see in creation is this Basically, this conditioning of a relation between difference that if you fail in, you get an indifference, right? And so everything becomes about how to coordinate yourself to maintain these tensions that are not given in the right ordering of the ingredients, but that have to be conditioned, you know, kind of every single time, right? That have to be kind of rethought and rethought. And it, it's, it's, it's interesting, too, because indifferent not different when the tree of knowledge is eaten from it becomes like every other tree so there's a way in which you know it's almost like if that makes you indifferent eden couldn't be eaten anymore even if god kept them there because ah, it's just another tree it becomes something you're indifferent to it's all the same right there's a way in which paradise actually becomes a place where because everything is the same it's interesting to think that a certain indifference comes in but then also what seems to be interesting is when indifference comes in, that's when impulse also seems to win out, right? As a kind of last hurrah, right? It's like, oh, I, once you kind of like lose a sense of the ability of the eye to properly coordinate you according to thought, well, then you just have the impulse. You know, that's the thing that's kind of given in the immediacy. So that's kind of what you give yourself over to because you really have lost the, the ability to relate to things distinct 
um, in the horizon that they are toward, like, you know, these trees are different, there's a different world. So then it's interesting how impulse kind of becomes more dominant um, in when when you have indifference take over because everything is the same. The other thing that was very interesting, I'll, I'll just say, and then I'll give it back to you. I, I was really taken when you were saying an echo, like toward an echo of what came before, like it's holding what kind of came before. It's very interesting because if it, if attention is something you have to actively maintain by keeping up this balance of the similarity and the difference and, you know, all of these different things. Um, it's almost like determinism is a kind of counterfeit of that because a lot of people say it's like, oh, well, we're just, uh, we're just products of the past, cause and effect. It's almost as if we don't have to give attention because whatever's happening is carrying automatically what came before, <laughs> right? True. So it's interesting because it's like a counterfeit. It's like, no, 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 no. Remember the Lord God that got you out of Egypt. It is not the case that you are carrying what came before automatically. You actually have to give it attention. You That's have right. to remember and be aware of it. So it's very interesting how determinism as such a popular doctrine is a kind of opposite of this, a kind of counterfeit of it. It's like, no, no, you, 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 you are a product of the past. And actually, there's nothing you can do about it. Whereas as thinking about no attention is remembering the echo of what holds. Oh, it takes a lot of effort to bring the past with you, to, to see what came before and to bring the origin into the present, to bring the story with you. It's not given. And it is true. Like, it is very easy to forget the story that you're in. It is not. It's not automatic, like some determined process that just occurs. You can easily forget the narrative you are in. You can easily forget that there's something you need to coordinate yourself toward. But determinism kind of almost brings a trick as if you don't have to worry about that. You're already, nature conditions you for you. You don't have to condition yourself with your eye and taste. It's just, you're already positioned by cause and effect. When really, no, it requires a whole lot of attention to coordinate you according to the echo. It's not just given uh, in what you're in. But then funny enough, determinism creates a kind of nothing is different. It creates indifference too, right? Because everything is just a product of cause and effect. It's all the same. Everything is the same. It's all been the same since the Big Bang. There's no creativity. It's interesting how where, where you don't have creativity, you get stuff like just causation, therefore determinism, therefore everything is the same, therefore it's not different, therefore you're indifferent. So it's funny because what this suggests is you need to practice attention to keep things as different so that you care about them, which then is to have them continue to partic participate in the Genesis story where God makes distinction so you don't lose that. So you have to pay attention to things in their distinction that you then relate to, which is hard because they're different. Otherwise, they lose the Genesis story. They cease to participate in that story because you're not giving them the attention they need to maintain distinction and to relate. So if you lose that, you can't relate to the world in a manner that is continually participating in the creative act that starts in Genesis. You know, God, you know, in Genesis, it's a story of distinction. God is making distinction that's relating. If you today don't maintain attention... Which, may, which creates distinction, but not exiling, you're kind of failing to participate in that creative act by failing to cultivate attention. Um, and you're actually, you're, you're then not coordinating yourself according to that story because you're letting things just fall into an indifference, not difference, that then creates, um, that then creates indifference. And in that sense, the very existence of care seems to suggest a successful participation in the initial creative act. Like if there is care, that means there's distinction. And if there's distinction, that means you're still participating in what God is doing in creating distinction. Uh, and also your the very act of caring suggests actually that it's in relation to otherness because you have to bring it out. Like it has to be stood out. Be that means there must be other things. So it is not an isolated entity that you're caring about. The moment you care, it is in relation because it has to be cared out. It has to be brought out in the context of all of these different things. And so it, it seems to have a certain sort of participating in the original position. You are positioning yourself now in position of the pre-positioning, the pre-coordination of Genesis that the successful coordination in generates care now that then 
you have to learn how to have that care. Well, this is the well, this is the interesting part. In caring about something, it is natural to want to keep it safe, mm -hmm. to make sure nothing bad happens to it. And if you can make it equal you and not be distinct, that feels like you can make it safer. And also, the more distinct it is, the more it stands out, the more it can feel like it's in danger. So there can be ways of trying to smooth out the difference, make it more like you, make it more like your ideas. And so there's a kind of temptation in care to move the thing toward the equal sign precisely because you care about it. And yet that would be precisely what removes the difference that would then create indifference that you wouldn't care, right? So there's a certain danger in care that you then have to learn to treat well. Otherwise, your very care and desire to keep the thing safe could run against the distinctions that is necessary for you to continue to care. But that's then where, you know, you have to coordinate yourself by Jesus lying down the light, like this sort of idea of that sacrifice, of that fearlessness, of that different coordination, or even your care could unintentionally move it toward this indifference, this not different that then generates indifference. But let me give it back to you. I believe we read each other's mind because as you were speaking, I was having stimulated ideas. And then as you continued speaking, those ideas were answered through what you were saying and allowed me not to have to say them. So I thank you. It was helpful to know that I'm tracking with you, that we are tracking something. With that said, let's pluck out coordination because we will use it, but also in the mood of what you were saying, investment strategy becomes apparently important. With the emphasis falling on the first word investment. Now, it is not lost on me that investments were occurring and people were discovering instruments for investing long before the Enlightenment. Long before the calculus, long before differential equations, people still understood if I plant this seed today, after a given period of time, I will have a tree with fruit. And so my expectation can be regulated in the intervening days by what I remember having done planting the seed, and what I believe will occur as a result of God smiling on me and my effort. However, the agricultural list would say it or phrase it. So investment is older than modern science, and it has endured modern science and indeed, it has taken on the flavor profile of our AI-inspired, for worse, culture of speed, speed, speed. Let's have little day trading experiments. Let's speculate on options. And let's guess the price through all these contraptions and cast our digital spells across Wall Street index by index, all this language, all this word salad, emulating the syntax of a microprocessor. Mm -hmm. But still, the urge to invest what is today for what can be tomorrow endures. Mm -hmm. The little box with the glass and the cord doesn't know that there is tomorrow. No piece of software has uploaded within it the concept of tomorrow. It doesn't exist in any of the electrical currents tomorrow. And yet all these devices are predicated on our interpretation of speed is good. Let's get there fast onward to the next thesis, but none of our instruments care. Right. Indeed, they go so below 
care for tomorrow is so far beneath the computer, it does not even exist for the computer. And yet this is the thing whereby we believe we will reach tomorrow faster than by letting today pass. You see, with speculation. But that's not in, but so there must be some difference that makes a difference between whatever the ancients were doing when they invested, what has continued to endure through the principles of investment, and what the algorithms or the people making the algorithms are selling us to believe that these high speed processing machines will allow us to bring tomorrow faster than the passing of today will bring it. What this really amounts to is the question, what is judgment worth? What is a judgment at all? Before we can evaluate how quickly I would want to be able to judge a state of affairs, because they're telling me you can judge it faster now. I should ask myself, Whoa, do I want judgment day to come faster? Because effectively, when you rule out the distance between the present and the future, you are ruling out the possibility of acquiring the virtue of patience. Now, we might ask ourselves, why is patience a good to be acquired? And two, what is judgment for? It's not obvious to me what the two answers are. But I think on our way, we should cite Solomon. Now, Solomon, in his case, is a nice or interesting recapitulation of the Genesis account, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Because what do we find in the book of Ecclesiastes? We find thematic melodies quite consonant with the Genesis account. Mm -hmm. What does he often tell us in Ecclesiastes? I had great experience, wide experience. I did not say no to myself. I mm. built palaces. I enlarged my gates. I tried all these foods, all these wives. Enlarged. I'm hearing in this, all the trees are good for you to eat. Yeah. It's a recapitulation. Mm. But what also does he say in Ecclesiastes? It might sound like an incidental detail, but if you're reading closely and you proseki, if you give attention to, if you find the echo that is holding what came before, you'll find in this little incidental detail, Genesis, he says what sounds like a proverb, a great city can be brought down by one bad player. Mm. I have seen it. I have seen a city fall by one bad man. What is that? All the trees are good for you to eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. One tree brought to ruin a great thing. What's the relationship, the similarity, and the difference between a city and a garden? A garden is full of variety without confusion. A city is full of variety without confusion. There's probably as many similarities as there are differences that make a difference. Now, what are they both predicated upon? Care. What separates a garden from a wilderness? Care. A wilderness is all the passions let free to do what they will. I don't want the sun because I want moss and bacteria to grow down here. So these huge, right? You're not going to have anything for the eye. But when you let go of care, when you have a bad player, when you, in other words, to cite you, as you said, when no difference lends to the phenomenological experience of indifference, the city falls, the variety ceases. The wise man becomes the writer of Ecclesiastes, saying vapor, all is vapor. Mm. The flattening. So I think the book of Ecclesiastes is a great recapitulation of Genesis with its not so incidental details. Mm. Fast forward without going too fast. 
in the gospel accounts, one of the gospel accounts, Jesus brings up the name of Solomon. How does he bring it up? He looks at the lily. But notice what he says. Not even Solomon. In all his glory. Ah, notice that not so incidental detail. In all his glory. This implies there are kinds of glory. There are similar and different glories. Solomon knew the distance that ought to be obtained between palm trees. He was a great cultivator. He's the wise man. The queen of Sheba, whatever, the, the south, traveled distances in proximity to, to see him, to reach him. She knew he was good. His glory also separated. What does this remind us of? The conditionings for the existence of in Genesis. He built God's temple and then he built his own separation. You see? They were not confused. So Solomon in all his glory. I don't take that as a negative. I take it as a recapitulation of the whole character of Solomon, which is a recapitulation of the whole character of Adam. Solomon in all his glory was not division, was not arrayed like one of these. So not all the lilies, one tree, one player, was not arrayed like one of these. Commentary on commentary, my friend. And then to bring your point in of the risk-taking, as you said it. What does Jesus say next? If God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, not saving, well, why not? It's beautiful. And you just said that its glory is greater than Solomon's. And I've spent so long reading about Solomon. Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little wisdom? You of little faith. Trust, a relational term. So we might ask ourselves, what is at the end of the sequence for us? Adam, Solomon, Lily? Tomorrow gone? Uh oh, things are getting worse. Uh oh, we just go into apocalypse now? Oh, you, you see what I'm saying? It's this almost diminishing return mm. on the investment. Mm. But he says, how much more will he clothe you? You of little faith, trust. So I think... Genesis can be read as the great book of wisdom, but the Gospels are teaching us to read it as the great book of faith, trust. That is, in the light of Jesus's teaching. So, how can we adjust or regulate our expectation through this energy? the revelation of the importance of trust in God. In God. Outstanding. Um, you said a lot there that was just complete fire. Um, I think first, it is very important to not see garden and city as opposites or in conflict with one another. The imagery in the Bible of city is quite positive that, you know, Nineveh go that great city, he tells to Jonah. And then we have, and then of course we have in New Jerusalem images of trees of life on the river and the city, like the environment and the city go together. And I think it is very true that a defining characteristic of a city is a great diversity that nevertheless is in relationship, just like a garden. So I think that overlay is spot on. I think connecting Solomon Ecclesiastes with 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 the with with Eden is is extremely good. And it also then suggests to what we were saying, 
I held nothing back. It was all the same to me. And then vanity of vanities. Likewise, I held myself back and off on the tree and it all became the same. And so that kind of speaks to this notion that Adam introduces an equal sign, all the tree. And that precisely then is what makes it vanity of vanities. So Ecclesia, there's a kind of echoing of I didn't hold it back. I held nothing back. And so, well, here you are. Uh, so, you know, you held nothing. Well, there you go. Um, uh, there's also this exactly. question that you asked, what is a judgment worth? What is a judgment for? What does a judgment do? I think this, there is something about judgment that is precisely the figuring out how to maintain. Judgment seems to be to the glory of relation. The problem is that Relation is not given. I think, I think because if relation is precisely a coordination of a similarity and difference, because all similarity entails difference, that means there's automatically in things a certain, well, Hegelian contradiction, a certain tension that is moving the thing either towards sameness, which would then be a facing, it would negate things, or it's moving it toward pure difference which actually is sameness because pure difference means there's no possibility of relation. So both of them is atomism, right? Like in things, in having a form as similarity, there is a tension moving it towards sameness or pure difference, both of which kills relation. Because pure, if something is purely different, that means it is not intelligible beyond itself. It has no it is entirely different. It's basically, you know, it's kind of hell, right? Like there's no symmetry at all, right? Well, sameness means there's no relation either because if things are the same, there's just one, there's not two. It's an equal sign, right? S judgment may have something to do with how do I keep the thing that makes it itself, the form, the similarity that also makes it relatable from going too far on the side of sameness or too far on the side of pure difference, both of which then kills the ecosystem. It kills the diversity. It kills the relationship. And it's not, well, this is then you're in the garden. Take care of the animals. Take care of the same similarity. Take care of the similarity in all things. Take care of it, right? Um, I really do. And this actually goes back to why I, I think it really is important to kind of say city and garden are similar. Because then it's not about escaping the city for the garden or escaping the garden for the city. It's about a coordination of diversity, right? It's about a certain shepherding, a certain making sure things are seen in the right way, right? That's a very different activity. That's a kind of Solomon providing kingdom, looking over things, taking, tilling the field. It is not simply an escape from, right? Um, and we're also, though, not saying the garden equals the city. We're saying they're similar, but the similarity requires a human to be there to judge the similarity and to maintain the similarity. And judgment seems to be the capacity to recognize when the similarity is lost, when it is going too so far on the side of pure difference, or it's all turning into an equal sign. Therefore, I've eaten from every tree. Therefore, I said no to nothing. It's vanity of vanities and it all dies, right? And this seems to be connected with hand-eye coordination in the eye. I mean, you know, right before we we're talking about the lilies of the field and the birds of the air, it's like, you know, if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be filled of light. Uh, you know, if your eye is unhealthy, your body will be full of darkness. Then Matthew 7 immediately is do not, you know, what you, you know, <laughs> be careful what you judge because there's a plaque, you know, you said there's a plaque, there's, but that's a judgment, right? Like there's automatically do not judge, right? Well, judgment in this sense, what's interesting is there's a judgment of people versus a judgment that is the discerning of the territory, discerning of the land, right? Why are you judging people when you should be judging if the, the ecosystem is together, right? Well, you're sir. judging that person is in the wrong. Well, you're, 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 then, you're weaponizing their difference against them when their very difference is a necessary node in the ecosystem to make a living city, a living garden, right? So be careful to use your judgment in a manner that is saying you are in the wrong versus using judgment to figure out the coordination of the difference to make a city, to make a thriving um, ecosystem of people, right? So yes. it's it's interesting too, because it's, you know, the same thing. It's like, you know, do not uh, put your treasure, you know, where moths uh, consume and thieves can break in and steal, like put your treasure in heaven, you know, where moths do not, you know, consume and thieves do not break in and steal, right? Like, where are where is your treasure? What are you looking at? 
It's connecting the location of your treasury with the health of the eye. Oh, and by the way, look at the lilies of the field. They have more glory than Solomon, right? So then the treasure that you should be putting in heaven is more akin to the glory of the lilies of the field than it is, say, the particular glory that is saying, uh, not saying no to anything and having all the women and having all the temples and having all the gates. That's actually not the treasure. The treasure is some sort of clothing. Well, what is that clothing? Like you say, it has something to do with faith. And the very thing you are judging... to. The judgment that you are participating in to maintain similarity is precisely possible because of a faith in the goodness of that coordination, in the goodness of that similarity that then becomes the kind of glory that well, then also is a testament that your eye is healthy so that your whole body is full of light, right? And so there's a maintaining of something. And, word, and there's a few more things. Um, uh, I, Charles, I, he wrote um, Sacred Economics. He's, he's an environmentalist. Charles Einstein, Eigenstein, um, fascinating individual. But one of the things that he points out that I think is really important, he says that first, a lot of people in the environmentalist movement say, oh, if we just removed human beings, nature would be better off. He points out that there are actually lots of places where humans go away and nature gets worse actually, that the name of the game is not removing human beings, but changing the relationship to nature. In fact, there are many areas where human beings who love the, love nature actually see what nature needs, and it's healthier because humans exist, right? You know, and the things that he was also pointing out is a lot of people will say beavers, um, the loss of beaver populations has hurt water movements, the loss of whales has hurt carbon, I mean, the distribution of carbon in the ocean and so on and so forth. So there's an idea, coyotes, there's an idea that certain animals in nature help coordinate nature. And if you lose those populations, nature is worse off. But with humans, no, 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 that's different. You know, humans are only bad. He's like, no, 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 actually, if you believe, you know, humans are part of nature too, not merely in nature. And if you remove humans, you actually get a less effective coordination of the environment. Right. The issue is not humans bad, nature good. It's that humans relationship with nature. We don't have a shepherding relationship with nature. We don't have an idea of trying to figure out how to bring the life out of the territory. Right. We, we're not trying to figure out and see the reason why this is very important is because he's suggesting that we need to think about human beings more as stewards more as custodians, more as shepherds and figuring it out, not like how do we remove the human footprint? No, how do we like have the human have a custodial role and actually nature is, is better off? I see something very similar here where the idea is that humans have a special role to be able to judge the similarity, the form, that actually, if we do well, we create a healthy ecosystem, per se, a healthy spiritual ecosystem. We maintain a garden, which is diversity and otherness that then we can help coordinate in a manner that leads to that, glor that uh, glory of the lily that is greater than Solomon, right? And that's not a matter of, oh, humans bad, get them out of the way, but figuring out how to actually shepherd that meta judgment, how to actually shepherd that coordination, as opposed to suggesting that, um, that's not our role. Uh, and in fact, when we try to coordinate, we just make things worse or, we're, you know, uh, we have no creative role. This is where people like Berjaev are like, you know, God didn't merely, uh, you know, want to save us. He wants to co-create. We'll have this creative activity, right? And that creativity. But then the question is, what is that creativity? Well, I think maintaining this similarity seems to be part of it. It's not merely painting or writing short stories. The creativity seems to be the harking back, giving attention to the creative act, which is this maintaining of difference that maintains relationship. And we need to think about being shepherds to maintain that. Well, that's, that's really hard, though, because that means you have to work with pluralism and difference and otherness and figure out how to relate to it when we tend to naturally associate difference with bad, right? Because it's difficult, right? Well, this is where Jesus is like, love your neighbor as yourself, right? Sit down with the tax collector and different things. The last thing I'll say is you made the point with AI and speeding up. I find it very interesting because where we are incapable of thinking, what is judgment for? Because I think ultimately your question is suggesting the limits of pragmatism. Like yeah. if we do not ask, what do we value? 
then we're st then you know if you say what's practical it's relative to what you value and if you and if you don't ask what do you value you end up just doing what's practical relative to the world or the zeitgeist and not even know it right like um basically what pragmatism becomes without value ethics is gdp what increases gdp exactly. well, well why is that pra why is gdp practical because it, it's a tautology of that because it is <laughs> you know oh okay john Great. Uh, so, you know, pragmatism always assumes a metaphysics and a value system, right? And so if you don't ask that, you know, the zeitgeist does your valuing for you. And so the question is, what do you value? And you say, well, maybe we value figuring out how to maintain the spiritual ecosystem that is like the city, like the garden, and figuring out how to coordinate those things versus increased GDP. Because what is the funny thing about GDP is that's a kind of equal sign. That's a kind of flattening. Everything is about GDP. So then everyone's indifferent to GDP because there's no difference in GDP. So I'm indifferent to it, right? But when you start talking about no wealth is the coordination of a garden or city like we see in the Bible, well, that's very live and very vibrant and makes a very unique music. And what's interesting to me with the AI stuff that's going on with speed, it's almost like I, I'm, I've been thinking about this. It's almost like when you're incapable of values, what you do is say, well, um, humans have to exist for there to be a society. Therefore, humans are the precondition of existence or society. AI is like human beings. Therefore, AI is good and AI is human beings faster. So yeah, that's exactly. good. Yep. So what you're doing is saying AI equals humanity. Well, then yeah. we're indifferent. There's no difference, right? When in yeah. fact, if we say, no, AI and humans are different in how they organize the world. They're similar. Let's spot the similarity precisely to be a testament to the difference so that we get good at it. Well, now we have a tool of conviviality for Ivan Illich that could extend humanity versus replace humanity. But what ends up happening is we're letting, we, we think that there is a value in speed because AI is like us, or so we convince ourselves, and because we are the ones doing the judgment, we're able to so convince ourselves. We have to exist for there to be a society. Therefore, something like us is, if not good, at least necessary for society. Therefore, we can't say it's bad. And if it gets faster, it must be good. So it's the value of an equal sign. That's all we can do now. Like without the ability to meta, I guess you could put it this way. It seems like judgment is for avoiding having the equal sign do your valuation. Mm -hmm. Like without judgment, then value is what, what equals, what equals commodity, what equals AI, what equals human being, what is like everything else. Ironically, the, the value is what contributes to the flattening of which if you succeed at creates indifference. Um, so there's a, there's a paradox. There's a kind of irony. That is an operation here. And it's as if it's weird because judgment, like there's also a thing like, why would you need to judge if it was all the same? Like if it's all the same, if it's all an equal sign, what, what is judgment for, right? right? It's all the same. You don't need to judge anything. It is the same. Judgment as an intellectual act and a coordination mechanism seems necessary precisely where there isn't an equal sign. And maybe it's not by chance when we don't know how to judge because we don't know how to value by our own story and narrative that then the value is the equal sign because judgment seems to be the opposite of the equal sign in a way. So if you can't engage in judgment, then everything is about the equal sign and the good is the equal sign and AI is like human beings, therefore it is good and therefore speed is really good because it's a whole lot of human beings really, really quickly well, why do you value human beings? Because, because otherwise we couldn't be having this conversation. So it's like this axiomatic circular logic that then becomes the source of value as opposed to a judgment of saying this is important and trying to learn how to be, be better shepherds of that. But let me give it back to you. When we talk about judgment, as you said, we're talking about many things and the word has a synonymity with other words of its kind, but that difference and similarity, I believe is taken into account in the passages you cited, and I will cite those in a moment. But before I do, I want to give a brief illustration think, that I think shows how difficult, 
not impossible, but how difficult it is to judge a situation. Take a hamster. And I want to say it is difficult to judge a situation by the lights of pragmatism, broadly construed. Take a hamster and put it in a cage, a transparent cage with wood chips at the bottom. And now you're looking at this square translucent cage that a hamster is in. And you might say to yourself, given the fact that the hamster is not coming out, why should it? Why should it? That is a question. We have food in there, pellets. We have water in there, a bottle. The water and the pellets are easier for the hamster to reach than if I were to open the cage, take the cage, drop it on its side, make it hit the carpet, and then let it go. I don't care what it decides to do. Keep it in the cage then with its pellets and water. And now you begin to watch it and you think, you know what it needs? Practically speaking, a wheel. Because then it can keep up its habit of movement. It can do it quite efficiently because it's not going anywhere, but it's going there fast. And then it can always stop when it wants to or when it is tired and then reward itself with water and pellets until it's motivated again to get on the wheel. I don't see anything wrong with that. I have a hunch there's something incomplete about that, but I can't, from a pragmatic point of view, tell you what is wrong with that. Because I think the world outside that box is a lot worse for the hamster than the world inside the box. And no one's going to argue with me that the wheel is a net evil because it does allow for impeccable exercise. And who's going to fault me for the bottle of water and the pellets? But I think something is missing, but I don't believe it's the whole world that is missing. So what is missing? I, a, a larger cage, i.e. my house, should I let it run in my house? I mean, that's still a cage. It's not the world but it's bigger than the cage. But if I let it run free in my house, it has no wheel. It has no efficient exercise. It has my staircase that I can't get up. So that's humiliating for it. It, it probably saps its motivation to try. I mean, it's gonna, oh, can't get up. It's not gonna get up the first step. So it's gonna reduce itself to the kitchen floor where it has to watch out for feet. It has to go in the corner where it's safe, like a rat. I mean, is this a better life for the hamster? Practically speaking, no. But when I put it in the heaven of practicality, the translucent box, I'm not sure it is complete. So what am I missing? I need to leave pragmatism to tell you. What are your thoughts on the the difficulty of judging a situation. Well, I I think that's getting at it. I think that's a brilliant example of the limits of pragmatism because um, pragmatism. Well, pragmatism almost has to increasingly bind. Like I was speaking, um, like we were talking at the net the other day. There tends to be this assumption that the most rational, if AI took over, it would, um, you know, explore other planets, imperialism take over and different things. It's like, well, why wouldn't AI just create the smallest of all possible places where it can have its infinite pleasure machine to itself, right? Like for us, we think, man, it would be really, you know, what AI would want to do is take everything over. No, it'd probably just make that little dust ball on the great divorce because like, isn't it like a whole lot of energy to take over the universe? Like, isn't it rational and practical to conserve energy and to just create a VR machine? Like, why wouldn't AI just make its own VR paradise to itself, right? You know, it doesn't care about human beings. So we tend to, without realizing it, we tend to assume, oh, well, the rational, practical thing for AI to do is take over the planet. 
Well, actually, there is a value of doing that. Why not the highest value just be energy conservation and pleasure? AI could give itself that. And then it binds itself to that little dust ball. I think when Lewis has hell be basically no bigger than a dust ball, that's pretty astute because that tends to be what pragmatism would do. Pragmatism like binds. Pragmatism like binds up. And it's really difficult to say why that is wrong. Like, why would it be wrong? to just make the smallest of all possible dust balls in which you can, uh, you know, have your, uh, be like your hamster. I think that's exactly, there's something about pragmatism left to its own devices that has a shrinking principle to it. There's a certain shrinking energy conservation principle to it. Like, why would you use a whole lot of energy if you could be equally happy using very little energy? Right. Like because pragmatic. So pragmatism would have you end up in a in a very bound system where you have pleasure with as little energy use as possible. Right. And that's what they and yet when we say that there's a way in which we say, well, that that's not right. Well, well, why not? If the moment you say it's not, you are valuing beyond what would be practical, because I guess another way to put it, like if you say. There's only pragmatism and there's no metaphysical speculation of any kind. Okay, then you have a body. Yes. What do, what do bodies like to do? Save energy. Conserve energy. Not expede energy. Right? Okay. Well, then conserve. Then go to the hamster. Go to, go to a, a place where you can just even conserve energy and survive. Right? Like, that's where you That has to be your basis. And if you say, no, there's something more... Like the glory of a battlefield or glory of experimentation or the glory of exploring. Unknown. That's a whole lot of energy, a whole lot of risk. And if you say it's valuable, then you're saying for some reason social acknowledgement is valuable. But it only has practical benefit um, from the certain standpoint that that matters. But that's not biological. You're now saying something in relation can be a source of value. Other people can be sources of value. And if they all agree that this thing called glory matters, well, then in that context and situation and relationship, this becomes practical. Well, then you've introduced a value system that is not reducible to just biological needs. You've introduced an entirely new system of value that has emerged from relations that are not reducible to its parts, right? So you're saying that pragmatism evolves per se, or it changes with time. Well, um, then it's a then it's like a garden. It is growing, and you ought to judge it. You need to be able to judge where it is and how it's operating. And like, there's a way too. And as you were speaking, it it's almost like judgment is one. I mean, judgment is in the very awareness that pragmatism has to go beyond pragmatism to function, right? Like you're like this. There's an inadequacy to pragmatism is a judgment. That's a like gift of judgment to see this incompletion, right? And it's almost like judgment is about some sort of metaphysical or mystery agriculture or like environmentalism. Like you're maintaining and shepherding and coordinating the metaphysical agriculture. And, and if you don't, you get a lot of weeds. And one of the main weeds we've got is pragmatism in this sense or, or an AI artificial intelligence. There's a weed in the garden because, you know, Austin Farah made a very interesting point that I think speaks to this. He says, why is a weed a weed? Um, because you don't want it in the garden. It's actually like morning glories can be weeds, right? Well, why? They're beautiful. They look like flowers. You know, you could have, you know, really a weed seems like it's a weed just by looking at it, but actually you identify what is a weed from what is a flower relative to design, right? And he's actually making the point that the problem of evil must always be tied to design. Because if you say this is evil, then, well, you're saying it's a weed, so you must say there's a design. Right. So he's trying to bring together and with he's a Leibniz scholar, he's trying to bring together this notion of the problem of evil with design. You can't say something is evil without saying that there's some sort of design. Uh, there's some sort of like garden in which this is not fitting. Right. So in a similar way, like the moment you say this is a weed, there are many beautiful weeds. And actually, you could also say in a tomato garden, corn is a weed because it will grow tall and kill the corn. Right. Suddenly corn becomes a weed in a tomato garden. Right. That's because you have a design and you judge this doesn't match the design. So the issue is you cannot, if you say this is practical, you are saying this is not a weed, which means there's a design. And then the question is, what is the design? 
what are you valuing? I'm trying to, you, you're valuing tomato. You're trying to grow tomatoes. Oh, so that's your end. That is your goal, right? And this is not practical for it. You cannot posit a pragmatism without po positing a teleology, some sort of end that you're going to. This is what Aristotle understood with the four causes, right? And so the notion of judgment seems to be what's necessary to tell the weed from the flower, to identify what is part of the garden or not, and what is a garden. A garden tends to be an ecosystem of differences that generate life. Because that's that's also, I think, important. Like, you, you know you've successfully struck the right balance or risk assessment or coordination of similarity and difference when you get more life, right? Like when the garden grows, right? So you know you you know the city has succeeded when it's vibrant, when it's alive. You know that you have the right balance between garden, like man's intervention, watering and seeds when there's life, right? So what's very interesting is that life tends to be the evidence, the coming forth, I'll give it to you, like life tends to be evidence that a judgment, you made a right judgment. You've correctly coordinated the relationship between difference and similarity. You've successfully identified the weeds that actually look like flowers, so they look similar, but then you actually knew they were different and actually needed to go because if that difference took over, then there wouldn't be any similarity. There would be a confusion, a fake fusion. So you're removing the weeds to make sure you don't get a fake fusion of all that. But let me throw it to you. No, that's precisely and beautifully stated. The, the name of the game is separating the weed from the chaff metacognitively first before you physically separate the weed from the chaff because then you know what you are doing when you are doing it versus if you do not metacognitively know first, then you are doing by design what you are not able to know that you are doing while you are doing it. So you are doing it automatically mm. and then looking back hoping which is not the direction we should be hoping in backwards but we're looking back hoping that what we did was in fact what we now know we should have done mm. which is to say my apologies in a convoluted way that knowledge happens at a certain time not all the time knowledge per se participates in the kairos in the opportune time it does not participate if you will allow me in chronos in chronological time this goes against the grain of the enlightenment it happens to be the case that knowledge is not just out there waiting for us to find it. It's not all around us, so to speak, just raw and there like a lily. It's not our, I don't know what you'd call it, a Russian doll that we need to take the time to open and then we open and then we open. That's what Bacon gave us in the new organ. Mm, mm. That all we have to do is take whatever nature yeah. is in front of us and put it on the rack. And if we stretch it, torture it, subdue it to our columns and our numbers and our analysis and our cuttings up, and we ask it the right questions, or if we ask it the wrong question enough times, eventually we will come to the time in which it gives up the ghost, so to speak. It gives us the answer. It tells us. It's communication. It tells us it's intelligence on the rack, torture, nearly to death, nearly to expiration. What it's doing in the beaker is becoming less and less itself until it finally tells us what it is. All that presumes that knowledge participates in chronos, in chronology. It's just out there all the time waiting for us. And if, in fact, knowledge participates at the opportune time, the Kairos moment, then we can begin to see what the, the wisdom in you will know the tree by its fruits. 
So knowledge of the tree does not come until there is fruit, which is to say knowledge depends on the opportunity for itself to be revealed. Not just everywhere, every square inch of that tree is knowledge of the tree. No, as a matter of fact, you might think it's every there, every square inch of that tree, bark included, is just there yearning to be tortured into giving up its secrets through instruments. But in fact, what you find out while not waiting for the fruit may be a lot of information, but it won't be relevant to knowledge of the tree. And this is the problem with what we call knowledge today. There's so much of it, we say. Well, is there? <laughs> or are we just calling every square inch of all that is knowledge of every square inch of all that is? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Is every square inch of all that is knowledge of every square inch of all that is? Apparently not if you will know the tree by its fruit. Every square inch of that tree is not fruit, my friend. As you and, as you and I both well know. <laughs> there's a lot of leaves. There's a lot of bark. Yes, there's is. a lot of unseen roots. Yes, there, there are so much of it is not fruit. And i.e. so much of it, therefore, is not knowledge of the tree. So you can have so much of the form without any access into knowledge of the form, which should make us be careful. And not so curious. Mm. I think curiosity comes downstream mm. from care. It mm. shouldn't be yeah. the fountainhead of our care. Well, I care about whatever I'm curious about. Uh-oh. I agree. How about try being curious about what you care about? Yeah. But never let your curiosity become more than your care because then you'll eat your care. Right? You'll just you'll become Socrates to your own care structure. And now you're left without any expertise of your own experience. You have no city within yourself because you let Socrates come in and question everything and become a stingray and poison or make numb everything because you, you let the man who knew only that he did not know, who knew only that he did not know. So he didn't even wait for the fruit is another way you could hear that. I know that I don't know, which means I'm not waiting around to find out. You let that man into your house, into your care structure, where he has no motive to wait and see the fruit of your care structure bloom. No wonder they teach lawyers this thing. Like that's all a law school is, is the myutic approach. I'm not saying lawyers are bad. That's not what I'm saying. I'm using, I'm using this as, a, sure. as a, an illustration because... A lawyer should interrogate every square inch and show that what we're operating on most of the time is confirmation bias. We're wanting to conclude what we already believe. Regardless of the evidence, this happens to be evidence, and therefore it leads to what I want it to lead to. A lawyer steps in, steps in and says, no, nah, I'm going to do everything I can through my questions and my parsing of the sentences to disabuse you of your confirmation bias so that we might see this evidence as clear as day. That's fine when we're in court, when we already are in an adversarial posture, yeah, yeah, yeah. when we've right. already declared our enemy. Right. But when we're not in that state of affairs, mm -hmm. which is most of the time, which for some people is all the time, most, some people never go to court, then we don't have to invite Socrates in our, into our care structure. And I think this was is why I'm letting go of Kierkegaard more and more as the days turn into weeks, as the weeks turn into months, as the months turn into years. Because he was the Seneca of Socrates. He was a great rhetorician, but he was myutic in his approach. And I think while it's exciting for someone who's a teenager, it can't help me at 35 years of age anymore. It can't help because I am being asked by my age to wait for fruit not to go where the grass seems to be greener and therefore socrates i bid farewell i have to well you said a lot that was just outstanding um there first off it is interesting the relationship between care and curious 
you know, to continue with the wordplay, I always find it interesting how cure is incurious, like it's a kind of medicine. And it's almost like without care, it's a medicine that's a poison. Because if you take certain medicines when you're not sick or you don't have the right subject, it actually has a problematic consequence, right? So care, the curious is supposed to follow from the care. But if you're taking medicine when you're not sick, that can take a, that can be a problem, right? Like it has nothing to cure. It has nothing to curate, you could even say, right? And there's something about curious. Also, I find it interesting how it's like is and us. It, like it needs the care, the I, us in relation. Like care is what creates curiosity between people, right? Oh, now I'm curious about you. But in a kind of right way versus I'm curious about you in an investigative way. Like <laughs> we know, like, you know, we know that curious from a care place is great. Curious from a non-care place is problematic right so it is a mistake i think to emphasize curiosity uh over care uh honestly if you have to convince people to be curious that could be a problem because care naturally generates a curiosity because you want to know more about it that is the love act i want mm. to know you right so curiosity without care is simply investigation which then it becomes investigation and it's a problematic investment. Like you get all these weird, like it's investigation, but it it's just the vest, it's not the heart, right? Like it never, it just stays something you wear, but it's not something that actually enters you and, and kind of fills you up, right? It's just something you're wearing, I suppose, like a vest or something. Um, so, but it, it is interesting because investigation tends to be curiosity without care, but in a problematic way um so it, it's interesting that relationship i think also there's this kind of notion like you were saying that's very important where there has to be metacognition as this kind of pre-step right otherwise you just enter into the automatic you know you're just kind of automatically following whatever the design is but the problem is how how can a garden automatically like a garden can't automatically have you take care of it there mm. has to be a cog like a metacognition there has to be a free thought about what you want to do <laughs> you know how you want to design it right like a machine much more easily kind of tells you how to be automatic in your relationship to it but not yeah. really a garden you have to every day look and see where the weeds are growing or what's dying and what's not like it is not automatic in your behavior to it um it is also interesting. I'm always taken by the difference between auto mastery and automatic. Like, like auto mastery is when you're so good at blocking, uh, you know, you're the goalie that gets so good at dropping ball, you know, blocking the ball that you don't even have to think about it, right? Like there's this kind of, there's this um, fullness of time, this fullness of practice and skill that makes you an auto master that seems automatic, but it's actually a result of attention, this gathering of the echo of remembering the origin that you work to where you get to the place where you can auto mastery, um, just engage in without thinking about it, right? It seems like the best one can hope for with a garden is something more like auto mastery versus automatic, where you got to the place where you're just able to tell what uh where the blight is without even oh that's blight and you just cut it like you're just able to and oh that's a weed and you just pull it like you have a certain engagement with the garden that is the fruit uh years it's the blossoming fruit like auto auto mastery is more like the fruit from a tree you will know them by their fruits right um like that tends to be the auto mastery but it's more like a dancer than it is a machine right and it's interesting because without the metacognition you get something that looks like auto mastery but it's actually the automatic, which means that you equal the machine. So there's no relationship now. And now you're indifferent to the garden because you treat it like a machine. You don't care about it. But it looks like you have mastery. And that's always the great, um, you know, that's always the great problem with uh, being enclosed, like with sin, right? It looks like glory. Look, you have all the women. You have all the empire. You have everything you ever want. It looks like glory. But it's vanity of vanity, right? So likewise, like sin and misdirection can lead you into something that looks like auto mastery, but really it's the automatic. It is, 
It is not really design anymore. It, it negates itself. It's just machine, right? Design, in order to stay itself, needs someone to enter in as the artist and the shepherd. Design of the garden, you don't want to turn into the, you know, the automatic machine of factory farming. Uh, you want it to stay a design, which means you need to have a human element who's engaging in metacognition, who's working toward the automastery so that it doesn't gain this kind of automatic character, right? But that um, that requires the fullness of time. That requires um, certain work. And I think, uh, so another thing that you said that I think is spot on is that knowledge is not chronos, but kairos. It's about the opportune time. I think, I think agency and freedom is similar too. I, I think that one's life is, you know, your freedom tends to come out in like seven or eight choices that you make at key moments, right? Yes. Like freedom, you know, freedom is yes. not, it's, a, it's another... Freedom and agency are more um, kairos than chronos, right? In fact, all of the things that matter most to human beings are kairos more than chronos. And the chrono, the chronos is only good to the degree that it remembers and it has attention to the echo of some previous kairos that you carry through, right? Yeah. And so the key is, and this is where I think judgment is a big deal. Judgment is about in, is about identifying what needs to be done. So that a Kairos moment occurs to or and or the recognition of a Kairos moment when it happens yeah. and or the recognition when you're engaging in Kronos in such a, a way that no Kairos can occur. And then the recognition, well, I, I think it goes to judgment, like the similarity, difference, coordination, how to keep them from going too far on one side or the other and therefore self-effacing both, right? It seems like maintaining that is necessary for kairos like that yeah. like if we call that situation i'll just call that similarity yeah. different situation judgment needs to maintain situation so there's the possibility of kairos um and then it needs to wait it even needs to be able to tell i need to wait this is a waiting period so that when the kairos comes i can be where i need to be for the kairos right yeah. And so that yes. seems to be what judgment is really in the business of. But that means judgment is itself Kairos more than Kronos. Judgment, yeah, judgment is it's something you work on day and day. You do these Kronos regularities, but it's precisely filled with the Kairos moment of knowing the ability of recognizing the Kairos and recognizing what needs to be done for the situation. And in the same way that like knowledge needs to be thought more chrono, uh, kairos, freedom needs to be thought more kairos, judgment needs to be thought more kairos. And, and if we, and in not doing that, we end up with more chronos versions of those things, which then what, what does that do? Um, it makes time all the same. It's indifferent. Yeah, yeah. There's, so you're indifferent to time. Yeah. There's no fullness of time. Time becomes a tree with no fruit. So you yeah. try to know the tree, but there's never any fruit and you'll know them by their fruit and you can't know the tree then. So you can't even know Kronos without Kairos. You can't. And what does that mean? You can't know what freedom is without Kairos. You can't know what knowledge is without Kairos. You can't know what judgment is without Kairos. And that all would suggest we can't know what it means to be human without Kairos or a shepherd, right? We can't shepherd or situate chronos without kairos without and you see if you don't have the judgment skill then you also aren't able to see you miss something so you also need the judgment to be able to judge that you didn't miss it and i think that goes to the hamster example because for me and then i'll give it to you there's a way in which what the hamster is missing is the ability to miss like there's yeah. nothing the hamster can miss that's the problem right that's what you kind of feel like you, yeah, you exactly you feel like there's nothing that can go wrong and that's what's wrong likewise like there's a sense of it was it, robbed of its knowing without knowing it was robbed yes and that's why it feels like such a vi violation like it feels like a violation like of the highest wrong like you violated this hamster because you took away a knowledge that it can't now even know that it lost Yes. Like you've you've kind of ontologically violated, like you've taken a world from it that it can't even know it's lost, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's what you kind of feel. You have no the... opportunity to care about what would have been natural for it to care about. Yeah, that's that's exactly and it right. You can't even mourn the loss of the caring for that thing. 
That's exactly right. And that's what it feels like pragmatism does to humanity. Like it robs us of a world that we can't even know we lost and thus are denied the ability to mourn that loss. In fact, we have to smile and talk about our GDP being up. Everything's great. AI is <laughs> coming. You know, put a smile on your face. You're not, a, that's, that's where like when Zizek says, I prefer not to, or Adorner is like, you know, there can be a certain good in uh, unhappiness. That's how, if I position that correctly, it's, there is something there because it's like, if by that kind of way that Zizek and Ordona, you're saying, I'm actually going to mourn that world that I'm not even allowed to mourn, there actually is a kind of sanctity in that, right? And that's what it does feel like pragmatism does, because you kind of have felt it. Like, I think there's a lot of people who, you know, in college or school were interested in the arts or metaphysics or philosophy. And what did the teacher, that won't get you a job. Yeah. You know, you were made to feel like, you're crazy, right? And so, and gradually, instead of being allowed, you weren't allowed to mourn the loss of that world. You were told that world never existed and you're silly to even think about. It. So you're not allowed to mourn because we didn't rob you of anything. In fact, you should be glad that you're going to get a better paying job, right? And so the entire society feels like it denies you the ability to mourn a world that maybe when you're younger, since you're being, you're losing, I feel like I'm having a world taken from me but I'm, I'm gaslit every time I'm told that metaphysics and philosophy and theology and art and value and all of that is dumb. But I really feel like it's not. Well, maybe I'm dumb to think that it's not. And slowly you're denied the sense that there's a world that you're missing out on missing. You're denied that, like the hamster, this deep ontological violation. Um, and then you're smiling because you're not allowed to mourn. And that smile becomes a testament to a GDP that you don't even have the ability to judge as valuable because that would require um, the sense of a world beyond the world that you weren't allowed to mourn. So the, the smile becomes the testament of a frown, I fear. But let me throw it back uh, at you. Yep. The smile, the, uh, what would that be? A parabola? Uh, a hypotenuse? Sure, a sure, with the curve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, would be... Uh, a collapse mm. this uh contradiction mm. the smile is the collapse yeah into the flat you know the smile becomes the frown and it's in different angle mm. the when you talked about the missing mm. all right let's go back to genesis and then to a few different parables with an eye to how the parables recapitulate the past, that is, hold forward what has been remembered. So I want to do that first with invoking or evoking your use of the term expectation by talking about missing out. Mm. So the etymology of sin, a Greek word, that an archer would be familiar with, means to miss the mark. So it's a word that someone who is trying to hit the mark would care about. So already, because it belongs to a sportsman, has, by virtue of its being connected to an arena of competitive play, engenders and is engendered by care. So we can't look at the word sin without seeing above it care. If we look at it etymologically, mm. an archer will care every time he misses the mark. When he ceases to care that he has sinned, he becomes indifferent to the game and walks away even if he stands in place and shoots a hundred more arrows because he has ceased to care whether or not he misses anymore. And by that admission, he no longer is an archer. He's mm. someone holding a bow and arrow. Mm. The difference between an archer and someone holding a bow and arrow is someone who cares mm. and someone who does not. Therefore, If we bend the bow a little, if we bend this rigid body a little, to miss the mark, on the one hand, to feel as if I am missing out, to use that warm idiomatic phrase, 
Well, I'm missing out if I don't go over there. <laughs> I know you want me to go down this route, but if I do, then I'll be missing out the other route. So I'm going to not miss out on that other route and go on that other route, ensuring that I miss the mark. So because I was, a, I was so afraid of not sinning, I sinned voluntarily. And I did it because I cared so much about not missing out. Mm. So care can work against us if we are not careful. I think this echoes what you said about the two ends of the extreme one can go down prior to judgment, pure difference or no difference. And those being the same thing. We can care too much if we are not careful. We will sin if we are afraid of missing out. All right. What does that have to do with some things? Well, if we go now back to Genesis and we see the preconditioning lines for the existence of Adam and Eve. And we mark the transition into Adam and Eve's narrative from the preconditioning thereof. We notice the first action done to Adam after he is formed, in my mind, echoes the predicament we see the, the spirit in, God in, yeah. at the beginning. What do I mean? What does it say? It says, he placed Adam in the garden. So you, you, I imagine the situation of this wide thing, kind of a bowl, if you will, that Adam was put in, placed in. His thesis became, I will now cultivate the garden. What separates me from someone walking around on the grass and a cultivator of the garden? I was given the commandment to keep it and tend it. I was told to care. Another way of hearing that, though, is I was given the attention to care. I was reminded that I could care. All of that came through the commandment that then activated in me the knowledge through which I respond to my environment. So becoming the gardener was the opportune time activated by the commandment, which was given to me when I was placed in the garden. Mm. So that bowl, that wideness being placed in, what do we hear in the preconditioning? At the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, it says he was over the waters, which were what? Formless and void. So look at the look at this pictorially. We have at one level formless and void. And then above, this is important, above that level, we have the Spirit of God moving over the waters. So we have conduct, movement, orderly, motion, all that stuff compressed. We have the Spirit of God over the formless and void. In other words, we have a separation. Yes. The Spirit of God is not formless and void. How do I know that? Because it tells me he was over the waters, moving over the waters. Okay, so above and below. Not confused. We have Adam being placed in the garden, as if over the formless and void, but not... Because Adam is not the same thing as the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is in Adam as the image of God, but the image is not the same thing as what it is imaging. How could it be? But it is quite similar, if not exactly similar. In fact, it is exactly similar, but it's not the same thing. So not over the formless and void, but still over what? The garden, form and fullness. 
variety of contact without confusion. That to me sounds like the exact opposite of formless and void. Mm -hmm. But the position of Adam to this content is the same position, the same thesis of the Holy Spirit over the formless and void, namely above. In a position of care, for God looks at it and makes judgments going forward. Mm. But the, but, let there be light. There was light. He separates light from darkness and then judges it. Says he sees that it is good. Similarity, difference, pronounces goodness. We have care. Preconditioning the existence of Adam. Who's caring for the garden. We haven't even come to the point where he names the animals, but we're already given their exact similarity. One more thing on that with the parable. The disciples come to Jesus the next day and they say, Master, I thought you planted good seed in your field. Did you not plant good seed in your field? We have tares with the wheat. And tares look like wheat, to your point earlier. It looks like a morning, what, what was that called? Morning glory, which is a weed. But it's a weed by virtue of it's not configuring with the design. Master, did you not plant good? Do you think that word was an accident? Hmm. I think it was a recapitulation. Hmm. Did you not plant good? This is a word of perception. Good seed in your field? It's an echo of the first few lines of Genesis. Now, they should ask this question because they are disciples. They're not the master. Their way of seeing is constrained by their master. So they come to him and ask the question, not knowing the answer. Why is that so important? Just like a tree is known, not by virtue of its bark or every square inch. It's not just there waiting to be known. The tree is known by its fruit, which comes at the opportune time, not sooner or later. So too, they don't know where the bad seed or the good seed came from. Really, now it's a little like messed up in their minds. How can these things be together? They're right beside each other. And I know it looks so similar, but I know it's not the same thing. I, I, this doesn't work for me. I don't understand. I don't understand. I don't know. Even though I'm seeing these things, I don't know what's going on. I don't know the situation, even though I am seeing every element of the situation, which tells me by implication, there is something outside the situation, greater than the situation, that if I have access to will shed light on the situation. It's above the formless and void. I'm just above the garden. So they go to the master and they're asking him the question and waiting for the answer is analogous to waiting for the tree to give fruit. The answer of the master is analogous to the tree of the fruit because by the answer of the master, the opportune time has come for the disciples to know what is going on. No, I, um, I think I think there's a lot there that you said that that's just spot on. Um, I I think also on the idea of over the garden for it is very interesting. That there's formless in another word. You know what's funny is formless is uh, sameness. It's all the same. It's formless, but that means form comes out in difference, and form is the similarity shared in the difference. And that similarity then is always a gathering as well, right? It's gathering up everything that's similar in their difference, right? But there has to be distinction for that possibility. Um, and so likewise, for there to be the gathering up of the wheat from the terrace, there has to be the putting together. So there's the, the difference, the possibility of the difference, but that's why there can be the gathering of the fields. I think the other thing that's very interesting Um is when I think about, like you mentioned, above. Like man is above in the garden. The it, 
The word above is very interesting. And I know Peugeot has made this point on the above is what gathers up, right? It's the highest point. So everything is gathered toward the bell. It's gathered toward the church. So there's a gathering, right? So if man is above the garden, then to me, uh, you know, when we talk about stewardship or do dominion or different things, that means man is in whom the world can be, the difference and similarity can be gathered. They, you know, they can gather things together into the situation if he's a good um, judge, if he's a good uh, steward, if he does his metacognition correctly, right? To be above a thing means you can gather it. Um, and that is the care. Like, I care about these things. So I want to gather into them together. And I care, you know, I care about maintaining the situation, the garden, the ecosystem, the similarity difference. And I'm the one who is here to be the, the gathering up. I'm above them. I'm to make sure these things are gathered in a manner that keeps them from falling into pure difference or sameness. And ergo, there's no relation anymore, right? There's a way in which Adam, I always think it's funny, like garden has the word guard in it. You know, guard, like the, to be Adam is the guard of the gardener. But that means maintaining the diversity, right? Maintaining the ecosystem, uh, maintaining the distinction. And that would be our role as well, right? To make sure that there's a vibrant nature and ecosystem and that that gathering um, continues. Um, and I think also, like, there's a way in which when the, they, the servants come to the master and they're waiting for the answer, there's a way in which they're all gathered to the master, like they're waiting for the fruit, like waiting for the fruit has a gathering principle to it as well, right? And so the master, and just like Jesus, waiting to tell the meaning of the parable or not at all, also knows that they, the fruit shouldn't show up till the gathering has happened. Like that is when the fruit, that's the Kairos moment. Okay, the gathering is here now, the fruit, because now the people have opened up their hearts to be able to tell that the fruit is in fact fruit, right? Like there's a certain like, oh, these are the kind of people that would actually meta judge. They actually would properly see this fruit that I offer that I'm able to do because I've engaged in that judgment, you know, that metacognition. I've engaged in the metacognition, therefore fruit can happen. And because they've been gathered up and willing to be gathered, that means they too have the metacognition to judge that fruit is there and to see it as a Kairos moment. But that means all of the um, emergence of the Kairos requires all of the different people in their relationships and situations to do their different role, to know the timing of the answer, to know that you need to wait till the gathering has occurred. And it needs to have a gathering function. Otherwise, people will not be open uh, to the fruit and they won't be able to discern the fruit as being there. Um, I think then what's interesting that does su suggest there is something about to be careful, full of care, you have to be careful about your care, right? And it's interesting because being careful seems to be like you're above the garden. You are to be careful is precisely to make sure that your care is gathering the situation so that it's a thriving ecosystem, so that you get this knowledge, that the Kairos knowledge, the Kairos freedom, et cetera, so forth. Um, a, a way also, I think it was very interesting on what you're saying, sin missed the mark. You know, what is the difference between the archer and the person holding the, the bow? It's interesting to think is the, uh, is the possibility of sin, right? Like the person holding the bow can't miss the mark because they really... They, they don't believe they're an archer. They don't, they don't actually think they can miss the mark, right? An archer knows that to be an archer, you need to hit the mark. Otherwise, you practically are just a guy holding a bow. You may call yourself an archer, but everyone can see that you're not that good. So it's just in name only, right? Like to actually be an archer means that you are under the possibility of sin, right? Which in a very weird way suggests that the possibility of sin is necessary for an archer to be distinct from a guy holding the bow. Likewise, there has to be a tree in the garden for the possibility of Adam to be a gatherer of the difference in diversity, otherwise just a guy in a garden, versus made in the image and likeness of God, right? So this tree that makes the possibility of missing the mark is also a necessary condition for the archer to be an archer as distinct from a man holding the bow. Likewise, for this guy taking care of the garden to, well, to be the image and likeness of God versus just another animal, right? Like why is an animal, why is Adam not just another animal in the garden who can walk around and has, uh, you know, and just, you know, he's just a human animal. Well, because he's been given a, a mark, you've been given a command, right? There's something about the human that is given a mark. 
is given a command where the other animals seem the tiger and the the deer do not seem to have been given a command the deer was not told don't eat from this tree one does wonder if the deers and the lions could go over and eat from the tree of knowledge and they would not die right one wonders if there is something about the human that was not allowed to eat from that tree because the composition of it would be poison to the human because of the human competition composition. I don't know, but it is interesting to wonder if uh, the panda was given the same uh, the same command uh, or different things. Um, but it is interesting because Adam, the human, is distinct from the other animals and it's creatureless and is given a command in the same way that the archer in having a mark can thus be an archer versus someone who's just holding a bow, right? And what's odd, one of the reasons, you know, it's it's weird, but one of the reasons precisely why pragmatism is so problematic is because there doesn't seem to be a sin. There doesn't seem to be a way to miss the mark, right? Because, you know, um, pragmatism, like if you're not asking, if it becomes this pragmatism where you don't ask about values, then whatever you think is practical is practical, so you can't really miss the mark, right? You just you just do what um, increases, what the society says is uh is going to increase gdp right there really isn't this sense that you can miss the mark under pragmatism you could be impractical but you still kind of know the mark uh and and you can and you can kind of participate in but there's no possibility of really doing what you think is practical as facilitated by the society and not being practical right like you can't really miss the mark you can't have a disordered good like i can imagine a disordered good like augustine says but what is a disordered pragmatism that doesn't seem to be so possible unless well unless you introduce values well the moment you introduce value like you would you would require values to say that's a disordered pragmatism well where did you get that from i was just doing what was practical right there's an assessment of the situation beyond the pragmatism to identify what is disordered or not right so the, the last thing I'll say, and then I'll give it back to you. Um, oh, I also liked what you were saying about nature on a torture rack. That was really great because that's exactly what we've done. We've taken nature, put it on a torture rack, stretched it, you know, and see what's going on. That's really great. I do also think it's interesting how, do we really have, do we really have expectation under pragmatism? There's a funny way in which I'm not sure if we do. We just have productivity or not. We have the, we increased GDP or didn't, but expectation, waiting in anticipation. Do you really have anticipation and pragmatism or different things? It's hard to say. It doesn't really seem so. Um, but I also like on this judgment of coordination of situation, it does a way to perhaps think about it with the Kairos moment in the fruit. I do like, you know, Owen Barfield, uh, he opened Saving uh, the Appearances with that famous example of the rainbow as an inkling. He's one of the inklings with Lewis and Tolkien, where he asked the question, you know, is a, is a rainbow real, right? Um, yeah, you know, it's not an illusion. Other people can see it as well. But what's interesting about a rainbow is you need sunlight, you need the right position, and you need rain, right? Mm. And you need all of those things for the Kairos moment of a rainbow, Right. So it's almost like judgment is the ability to go, okay, we've got the sunlight. I've got a good range of the horizon. I have those things, but now I need to, I need to wait for rain while the sun is still out. Like now you judge that I need to make sure I need to wait for that condition to be met, actually. Um, and, if, and if I say to you, well, I'm just going to go to where there's a rainbow. Well, how do you do that? You don't know, like, is that on a map? Where you can go to the location where the sun is out while it's raining and it has a view of the horizon. That's not on a map. You just have to know the conditions, right? That's why the grass is greener on the other side won't work, right? You have to have this sort of patience. And you have to judge these are the things that is needed to create the situation of a rainbow. Um, I think that gets at what judgment seems to be doing. You're coordinating a situation to maintain the similarity difference so that life comes forth. So that, you know, that, so that the kairos comes forth like the rainbow. But you have to judge the conditions that make that was possible, maintain those conditions, and then wait in them so that the rainbow comes forth. And I think when we think of that way, where agency and freedom is about those moments, those five moments of the rainbow, knowledge is the rainbow, uh, and it's coming forth, then it's about to be a human being that's shepherding or as a creator is really about identifying what coordination, what conditions are necessary 
for certain rainbows, love, beauty, truth, goodness, relationship, and so on. And keeping those things in relationship, in a situation, keeping the tree alive, but for the fruit. And unless the fruit occurs, unless the rainbow happens, you have no knowledge here. Yeah, if the tree dies before the fruit comes up, that's a problem. But the point of Kronos is for the Kairos. The point of maintaining these conditions is to make sure there can be a rainbow. The point of like shepherding all of this is for that moment that otherwise could not be possible that then changes the meaning of all moments that can follow from it. But that's a but that is a different way to think about what your senses are coordinating, what your knowledge is coordinating, what you're working to coordinate. And the only thing I guess this is also where care comes into play. Um and then alas, I will have to go in a little bit because of work obligations. I don't know oh, where yes. two hours and 30 minutes go. Just it's it's a delight is that just like that. <clears throat> it's almost like you need care to stay waiting for the rainbow. Like you wouldn't stay <laughs> if you didn't care about it because there is no rainbow. You're just waiting on it. People think you're crazy. Like care seems to have, well, one, you have to value the rainbow you have to value the Kairos moment and you have to care to stay and you have to maintain, um, you have to care to maintain the ability to continue judging those conditions so that it's possible. Without care, um, you would leave. You you wouldn't do it. Um, and then you would lose the possibility of seeing a rainbow and not even know you missed the possibility of a rainbow. And you wouldn't, and then if other people think um, you were always silly to even try, if you one day started to mourn the loss of the rainbow like a world you didn't even know, people would make you feel silly for mourning it, right? And so there's something about care that keeps you in that place, but but let me throw it back to you. The With the rainbow, I see that as analogous to the cross mm. because we, we note how in the Gospel of John at the wedding of Cana, the mother of our Lord comes and says they have no wine. And his response is telling. His response is, my hour has not yet come. So the hour of what? The hour in which he would be glorified by the Father. And what is that hour in which he would be glorified? That hour is the hour in which he would be lifted up, as he says in the Gospel of John. And in being lifted up, like the serpent in the wilderness, alluding to Exodus, he would draw all men to himself. Now, if he would draw all men to himself as he was lifted up on the cross, we have a picture of the above again. And the drawing up of that which also draws up, namely man, Adam. So if Adam draws up the variety of the garden, what draws up Adam? The Logos, second person of the Trinity. He who said to his dear mother, the Theotokos, my hour has not yet come. When presented with the problem of those who were being married, having no wine. So, and that was his first miracle. Great miracle in the Gospel of John, turning the water into wine. But it was not the miracle in which his hour had come. In the hour in which all was gathered up. So the rainbow was not there, but many other conditions were. Faith was, for the mother of God says to the servants, whatever he tells you, do. He told them to fill it up to the brim, and they did. So many conditions were in place, but not all. And that's why the hour had not yet come. So, and the hour, when it did come, was recognized. As we read in the later chapters of John, the hour has come. And in that prayer that he makes to his father. So not only did the rainbow appear, the fruit on the tree, but the acknowledgement of the tree as such was made. While voluntarily being nailed to it. Mm. So the second tree undoes the work of the first tree. The And note these recapitulations of the one and the many. So if many trees are available and good to eat, but one you shall not eat, division, 
When God separated the light from the darkness and saw that it was good, judgment. Adam, here is your commandment. All of these are good to eat, but one is not. The way for Adam to participate in God in becoming like God would be to say, and notice time lapsed between the giving of the commandment and the entrance of the serpent, who was subtle. So what was going on in that time? Well, since Adam did not sin immediately, we might say what was going on in that time was, ah, that tree, not good to eat. All these other trees, good to eat. They're separated. That's good. Just like God said, light from the darkness. That's good. He was becoming like God in his judgment. In his noose, N-O-U-S, in his mind, in his heart. His perception was growing. And it was growing in the direction of repeating God and echoing God, not at the same level, but at a similar level. Fast forward, master, did you not plant good seed in your field? What does the master immediately say in response? An enemy has done this. The transmutation of the question, did you not plant good seed? So there's good seed and then there's bad seed. The bad seed makes wheat that looks like wheat, but is not wheat. That's a tear. I I'm comfortable at that level of difference. The master who's at a higher level, but at a level I can understand because he cares for me, says immediately an enemy has done this. You can almost see it projecting out from this particular wheat and that particular appearance, apparent wheat, tear. The master goes beyond that to out there is an enemy. He is nothing like me. He's my opposite. He, he, he doesn't have your good in mind. He doesn't care for this wheat or my field. He is my enemy. He's not even at your level. He's my, an enemy has done this. I know he's an enemy. I've recognized it. I know his fruit. The disciples weren't up to saying that. What they, what they could understand was these two things are not the same. The master says an enemy has done this. The disciples then say, okay, well, so it's, it's really bad. An enemy has done this. Therefore, we should pluck it up, right? No. And here's the key. Verb. Wait. Wait, what? Wait. I, I have knowledge. You told me an enemy has done this, so it's really bad. But you're telling me wait. Wait until, so not wait forever, but wait. So my giving you the answer was the opportune time. But now there's another opportune that this waiting is the ingredient, is the in-between of the two palm trees. Wait until the harvest, wait until the wheat has come into full its fullness and the tares have come into their fullness, lest you now, not knowing completely the difference, while you're tearing up the tares, you also tear up the wheat. Wait until they're both in their fullness. Then take my wheat into the barn. Separation. So already there was a separation. Wheat, apparent wheat. There's a further separation. Take the real wheat into the barn and bind up the apparent wheat, the tear, and burn it with fire. Big difference. Even wider than the original separation. But that took time. That required waiting until the judgment, which already was said at the beginning would happen, not by the disciples. The disciples weren't willing to wait. They had to be commanded to wait. Why? Because we really don't know what to do with time unless we're told from above what to do with it. Mm. So I, I think there's much to, to see in the relationship of Adam to God and Christ to Adam and us now on the on the other side of the cross expecting and waiting for the resurrection. Mm. 
that's all I have. The ending is yours, my friend, because I know you have to go. I, I if I did not have a open house I had to manage tomorrow, I, I've appreciated this um complete delight. It's just it's just a complete delight to speak with you, Matthew. So thank I have you. Such I have a great time too. It's it's the delight. And um I appreciate it. And it's interesting because I like um what you're noting on, we don't know what to do with time without something higher telling us. We don't know how to gather it. You know, the higher tells us how to gather. And if we don't have a higher to gather it, we don't know what to do with it because we don't have a point to gather it toward. But the point to gather it toward itself cannot be among the gathered. Therefore, it has to be a faith relationship that we bring into the world in gathering it toward it. Like you gather and up, like it's gathered in that way right so there's a participating in the drawing up right you animate it up you give it character and form up that's interesting because draw form you draw so like you're participating in the gathering up toward the thing higher than you which does give it form which is similarity which then gives it intelligibility and in giving it similarity it has relationship because it's interesting because if humans are gathering time towards something higher then the human puts time in relationship with one another, right? Like if the Christian sees all of creation in participation of God, then you're gathering everything up and saying, actually, it's to the glory of God. So you're gathering. It's not fragments, right? Like you, there's a gathering up of everything, the rock, the tree, the Zoom call, the, the desk, the work. There's a gathering of all of these things toward a kairos that are not themselves the kairos, but that act of gathering them in chronos is creating the conditions of the possibility of the rainbow in the fullness of time, right? And so I think that's that's a very interesting point. Um, I'm also taken on the stress on the hour not come. I think that's exactly right. I think so much of uh, being human is precisely the recognition of the hour and knowing that you cannot will the hour beyond the hour. One must wait for it and be ready to judge it. And, but but then there's also a do not worry about your life, what you will drink, what you eat, what you will wear, because you're because like if you actually can judge the hour when it's there, you know, seek first the kingdom of God, is all these things will be added unto you. So you have to go, well, I need to, I can't be waiting to judge the hour because I gotta go take care of these things. No, 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 no. Be ready for that. Uh, because all these things will be added unto you. Uh, you know, so make sure you don't miss the hour. It really matters. Um, and there is something interesting about human beings that seem to be at their best in a mode, not of, it's this interesting difference between striving to say, be the CEO of a company, like, um, kind of, and not anticipation. There's another word for it. Like where you're like, um, ambition, mm -hmm. what's the difference between ambition and waiting for the hour? That difference seems really important. Um, and seems to also be massive here where you don't really, it's not like you're not being told to have ambition for the fruit, but there is a kind of ambition in faith. There's a kind of, in, you know, expectation that's good, but then there's a bad expectation. So there's, what's interesting is ambition seems to be different from the waiting for the hour that you are training to be able to judge and recognize when it appears that requires faithfulness, but it seems different than ambition. Like ambition is very chronos. Faith is very kairos. Faithfulness is, I believe there is a kairos that can break through. I believe there can be a rainbow and I'm going to be ready for it. Whereas ambition seems to be, let's like use every hour and moment to build towards something, right? And so it does seem like the difference that makes a difference between all these similar things like faithfulness, uh, you could even say dedication and ambition seems to have a lot to do with your philosophy of time. You're thinking of time and time seems really important. If you don't have a Kairos, you seem locked like that hamster in the cage. You seem locked in the uh, in a world that cuts you off from another world. You don't even know it. Right. Like and you can't even mourn it. Right. And so the relation to time seems really important. And there is, of course, something second, you know, Christ breaks in at a particular moment in history at a particular place. So that's fundamentally Kairos, right? Like Christ is a is not a chronos 
uh, you know, Christ is this moment, this person of the Trinity is coming out of Kairos. And there's something about human beings that seem to be really needing a Kairos so we can't dwell in our own skin very well. And no. um, and that um, and that Kairos is what gathers the Kronos because it's higher. It's above the Kronos. And if you don't have it, then the Kronos can't be gathered. So it's just sequence without duration, as we've talked about before. It's um, it's seconds that can't add up to a moment ever lost. Uh, the only way to avoid a Zeno's paradox is uh, is to add another dimension. You know, they talk about in mathematics to move from algebra to geometry is no different. The only way to avoid all these kind of Zeno uh, para contradictions, paradoxes, and chronos is to uh, add kairos. And if you don't do that, that higher dimension, you get in trouble. The only way to move beyond meaning crisis is to is to add kairos, really, to add these kind of fullness of time. The other thing I was thinking about that's very interesting with the parable, it's almost like enemies hide difference where God proclaims difference in the name of relationship. Like they're hiding it. They're creating difference between the reed and the tares, right? And but but they're hiding it. They're acting like there isn't difference, right? Whereas God's like, no, nah, these are he different. Came at night. He came at yeah. night to plant the seed. Yeah, which you can't see anything. Like it's all dark, right? You can't be seen. It's all the same, right? While they were asleep. Yeah, that's right. So there's no con there's no judgment. There's no consciousness. There's this kind of uh, you know formlessness, right? Uh, formlessness without uh, without uh, the spirit. Um, so there's interesting because also when Satan says it's like you'll be like God, right? Well, what's the difference between that like God and you know made in the image and likeness of God? Well, there's different angles. Satan could be saying you'll equal God, sameness. Uh, or there's also a certain notion that Satan is introducing something that's actually the same, something that's already there. He's already like God, as if it is different, right? Which means it is not. It, which means it is not similar. It's not in relationship. It's 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 like Adam is being tempted with the terms of his relationship with God without God. I want the terms of the relationship without the relationship, the persons of the relationship. I want the benefits of the relationship without the person of the relationship. Well, people are like that all the time. They want uh, they want attachment and sex and someone to live with, but actually without emotional intimacy, right? Like we have a lot of people that want relationship without intimacy. There's a way in which to be like God in the way Satan is tempting it is, uh, you know, relation without intimacy. Well, that's just kind of, um, that's just kind of sameness. That's moving the difference in the edges that can actually define the difference. And so there's a way in which evil introduces sameness, which then, of course, if, if evil is somehow a privation, there is something about sameness that is the loss of difference. It is the loss of diversity, it is the loss of ecosystem. It's kind of privation. It's a loss of substance in that sense. Um, because pure difference is sameness. That's the irony. Pure difference is also the same as sameness because there's no similarity by which there is intelligibility. So whereas there's something about evil that hides difference, acts like it's all the same, acts like it's not different, you know, uh, there's something about God that proclaims it and says it is good. Which then, of course, is very difficult for us to get because we tend to associate different with bad, with not good, a lack of relationship. I think one of the great revelations of Christianity is that it is declaring difference as good. Difference is actually a benefit to relationality. It is actually the testament of an ecosystem, a garden, a city that wouldn't be possible otherwise. But that requires stewardship. That requires the meta judgment by which to maintain it and to figure out how to make it thrive. And so that also then means that to be a Christian is not merely about having the right beliefs and propositions, but to rightly participate in that meta judgment of the situation so that there could be a rainbow in the fullness of Kairos time that you're not giving over to the temptation of Kronos or giving over to the temptation of not actively participating in figuring out how to identify that form so that there can be relationality, so that there can be a healthy ecosystem. It is a very active undertaking. And look, I think that is that is shown in, in Paul and Acts trying to discern these situations. What does it mean to be Christian in Corinth? What does it mean to find the similarity of the person in Christ in this unique situation that is different and yet maintains a fidelity to the persons of Christ so that there's a similarity, but it's not the same? Because Corinth is not the same as Jerusalem, but that's why we can make a budding ecosystem that is a new Jerusalem that is more global, entailing all of these differences that creates a greater harmony. Um, but I think that 
that sort of suggests what judgment is for. I think it's something about gardening. Uh, it's about judgment is about being a good gardener. It's about knowing the fullness of time. Um, and it and it is about also too, like when that example is like, well, wait for the the, the weed and the tar, tar to come to fullness and then we'll take them apart, right? There's a way too in which in the end, the difference will come out. <laughs> you know, in the end, difference will come out. We will see it and we will be able to tell what needs to be re removed and what doesn't. I think also too, that's what's kind of interesting in time, like when two people get married, for example, oh, we're the same. It actually turns out you're different, but the whole beauty of marriage is that's an opportunity for similarity, which is not reducible to the facticity. The very emergence of difference then begs the question, well, how are you going to work to make, make sure that now there's still a form, that there's not a confusion, a fake fusion, but a togetherness, a relationship that actually is more powerful because you are not the same. The whole reason you came together is because you thought you were similar, but that means there's a difference and that difference is a difficulty, but actually it becomes a glory if as that comes out with time, you figure out how to pull the sin from the holiness, the wheat from the chaff in the relationship so that it can have a certain healthy ecosystem that otherwise would not be possible. But that's to wait on the similarity and then to do the work to maintain it which then is not reducible to facticity. And I think then it's higher. It's gathering up the marriage. And you know that it's not reducible simply to your preferences. That it's something that you have to work to keep alive. And that's why you know that there's a story greater than pragmatism, that there's a world um, beyond the world that you are in, the um, the position in beyond the, the simple facticity position you're in that you can then be toward and work toward. And that makes something much more beautiful, something much more full, and something much more alive, something more diverse. There's then the spirit over the formlessness. Now it has form and you're placed in that garden that you continue to do the work uh, to shepherd in relationships. So I, I think um, I think that all, I appreciate everything you shared and it, it makes me think of those things. Fascinating. Well, Ma well Matthew, it is always a treat. I, I always enjoy a chant. We'll speak again soon. I, I appreciate it. Thank you for everything, Matthew. Always, always a delight. I don't know where the hours go. Have a good week, my friend. You too, Matthew. All the best.